around marketing technologies. Industry leaders uh, uh, speaking at today's session include Sharad Dhar, uh, Chief Operating Op Officer, Policy Bazaar, Manu Lavanya, Director and Chief Operating Operations Officer, Max Life Insurance, Scott Brinker, VP Platform Ecosystem, HubSpot Editor, Chief Martech.com, Program Chair Martech, Paran Thiruvangadam, CTO of MedLife, Yash Dayal, CTO of Zivame, Sandeep Kora Maveli, Director of International Growth, Spotify. Now, uh, uh, sorry, Shopify. Now, before we begin, uh, if you have any questions, please put them on the Zoom chat box. We are also live on Facebook, Instagram, as well as Twitter. You can use the hashtag Martech India to post any queries, comments, insights, or a piece of information that you may want to convey. So if there is anything that you want to speak to us, please feel free to drop in your queries. Uh, we now begin with the first session of the day. We have an expert talk with Sharad Dal, COO Policy Bazaar. To give you a little brief about Sharad, he has 20 years of experience running businesses in the internet as well as FMCG spaces. He successfully handled teams as large as 1,000 people, as well as worked in small 10-member startup situations too. He is also an advisory board member at Credit Enable India. As a managing director of TripAdvisor India, he launched the Indian business and grew it up to a top notch of three travel websites in India within two years of its launch. Before that, he was the MD at Expedia and was responsible for launching the brand in India too. Welcome, Sharat. Rohil, kindly start. Thank you so much, Sonakshi. Uh, just to put things in context, that last four days have been amazing. We had uh, some great speakers um, from India, abroad. So this conversation continues and today is the final day. And as uh, Sonakshi said, that this is the precursor of the big event that we uh, will be hosting in uh, September. Uh, welcome, Mr. Dull. Um, great to have you here. And uh, uh, let me... Uh, yeah. Likewise. So we, we see that you know, 90 days especially, you know, has been a period of uh, innovation, adjustment, alignment. I want to first understand from you uh, your uh, story of these 90 days to begin with. So uh, I think, you know, uh, the pandemic has been, uh, has been a completely unprecedented uh, and, uh, you know, uh, tragic uh, kind of situation, which I hope never gets repeated. Uh, one of the things that has happened uh, during the course of these last, uh, you know, tumultuous two, three months is that uh, in our category, what it has resulted in is that the need and relevance of insurance as a product in a person's life has come to the fore for many, many people. True. Uh, and, uh, you know, it started out with uh, a lot of people uh, uh, querying and uh, searching for uh, life insurance. Uh, but over the last few months, the last couple of months, it's been more about the health insurance space uh, as people are fearing the uh, rising medical costs associated with the illness. Right. Uh, so from a business perspective, uh, you know, it has been uh, fairly, it has been a, it, it's been a, you know, we've had a good time in this uh, period. Uh, we've grown at about 70 to 80% in what is typically a very, very mm. lean period for insurance as a category. Uh, right. And actually, interestingly, you know, it, insurance was a product that was typically bought at the end of the uh, uh, financial year. Financial year. Yeah, That's as true. a tax investment. Yeah. And I think this is the first time that uh, it has gained in terms of people's consciousness as a product that's actually uh, there to secure your family's future uh, right. by paying a small sum of money. And, uh, and I think a lot of people are realizing that insurance is actually a beautiful thing. Right. Uh, so, and, and we've seen that the demand has come from not only the metros and the larger cities, but also from uh, tier two and tier three cities, uh, whose contribution has actually gone up to almost about 15% now from earlier being five to 7%. Mm -hmm. So it's been uh, a, a fairly, uh, you know, there's been a, a lot of surge in terms of uh, the demand that has come in. Uh, right. People have, uh, obviously, it's anxious times and hence uh, we have seen that uh, this has gone up. As far as, you know, what we've done to try and make it as seamless as possible is that we have uh, worked hard with our partners, the insurance companies, to actually uh, enable people to do telemedicals and video medicals rather than mm -hmm. have to go out for a physical medical to a medical center. Mm -hmm. 
and that's right. something that has also helped in terms of uh, you know ensuring that people were able to buy uh, insurance during this period of time uh, and and that that that's made the whole uh, experience much more seamless and the digital uh, channel obviously at this time has been the one that has been most unaffected so that's also the reason why there's been a surge in terms of online buying of of insurance as a category which right. on an overall basis is a very under penetrated category in the country right yeah absolutely i think that perception shift you know that it is a tax saving to something which is essential i think that has taken place definitely and at the same time you know i think there has this surge has posed uh, other challenges one is that uh, the back end part of the you know the tech part of it you know uh, especially the marketing side of it were you prepared to uh, kind of uh, adjust quickly to the growing demand uh, did you have to go through certain new features uh, what has been the tech mark tech journey side of it you know, of these 90 days the surge that you said right so i think what one is that you know as a as a as a company uh, we had a lot of people uh, who were in you know insurance advisors helping people uh, buy insurance over the phone and very quickly we had to move all of these people to a work from home situation which was something that uh, fortunately because we have all our tech in house we were yeah. able to actually moved the entire force of over 6000 people uh, to start working from home fairly right. seamlessly and that was a, that was that was a you know a great uh, uh, first mover advantage in that sense for us because we were we didn't have any uh, teething issues in this regard as far right. as the marketing side was concerned what we quickly realized was that uh, both on the online side uh, the consumption of digital uh mobile and app uh, uh, was was ha- was going through the roof and uh, similarly as far as tv was concerned day viewing was going up as more and more people were sitting at home uh, right. and and so one of the things that we had to do was to quickly reorganize the way we spent our money uh mm-hmm. focusing primarily on tv uh, and which which typically we would advertise in in only the peak hours uh you know in the evening slots but we were able to be moved our media spends across uh, you know day paths uh, so as to reach a wider audience and uh, also another thing we realized was from an audience point of view that uh, genres like news uh, you know really went up as people were seeking more and more information about what was going on with regard to uh, covid and uh, so we had to move our money there and so 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 as a brand one had to be agile about it and on the digital side it was really about you know expanding our uh, our reach uh, through a lot of programmatic buying which we did uh, you know implemented fairly uh, effectively and quickly right. so sharad what are the changes that you have seen in the consumer behavior lately has has there been like a little difference have you seen some extra attraction in the last few months yeah so it's very interesting i think consumer behavior uh, so insurance as a category has typically been a category where the consumer behavior is one of procrastination so uh, when you talk to somebody everybody realizes that yes it makes sense to buy insurance but at the same time it's a it's something that the gratification is you know so far out and typically the person who the, the person who insures takes out the insurance never gets the gratification that's the that's the way the product really is uh and so it's it's so it it often results in people pushing out this decision but what has happened in the uh, what has happened during this period is that because there has been heightened levels of anxiety around you know what's going on uh right. people have gone out and uh, actively you know searched out for insurance as a category so what we've seen is that uh, uh the talk times that we had with people has gone up tremendously the amount of time they spent on the website has increased uh we are able to get through to customers far more easily than we were able to earlier and all of that has resulted in increased conversion for us uh, uh, on the on the website uh, as well uh, the right. other thing that we've seen is that a lot of younger customers have also taken out insurance and and that's something that uh, possibly we are seeing people uh in their first jobs shifting from making an investment decision uh to taking an inv- to taking an insurance uh, uh you know decision uh in terms of their financial planning for their futures 
Uh, mm-hmm. So that's that's the other thing that we've seen. And like I was saying earlier, that typically it was okay. You know, I can save some tax at the end of the year by buying an insurance policy. That's what I'll do. Now it's uh, you know April, May, June were typically the uh, complete off season as far as insurance was concerned. But for the first time, we've seen people buy insurance in April, May, June, and that's primarily mm-hmm. because they're finally buying it for the right reasons, which is really about protection from uh, death, dis- disease, and disability. which is really what this uh, product is all about i think i must also add that uh, policy bazaar you know it has uh, you have evangelized the space in a way you know it has been a whole lot of things maybe they are coming together now and you know that's one of the reasons so my next point is that you know what has also happened is why consumers are coming to you and they want to get uh, look for the best policy and everything else however you know selling is uh, for marketers you know especially selling in this uh, sensitive time is also an issue yeah uh, is it different from uh, what it used to be how are you using this tonality emotional tonality in your tech part of it the tech facing side the marketing tech side to make it more kind of you know acceptable right so i think you know as a brand one of the things that uh, we've always focused on is trying to expand the category so uh, just to give you a bit of uh, you know uh, background on the category uh, insurance is a fairly underpenetrated category in india and even the people who have insurance are typically very underinsured uh, so what is uh, so what we've really believed in is that our growth will come from growing the category and that's what our focus has been which has been as in terms of communication it has been really about heightening the need and the relevance of insurance as a product and at the same time emphasizing the accessibility of it so right. so letting people know that it's not as expensive as they possibly think it is uh and and why they really need it so as a brand it's always been about being straightforward being direct and at the same time offering a solution and i think that has held us in very good stead in these uncertain times where people are looking for solutions i think uh, you know it's an unfortunate uh, truth that uh, the future is uncertain uh, mm-hmm. and and i think uh, stating it up front might seem insensitive but at the same time uh, it if people are able to realize that there is a solution for it which is by taking out an insurance policy and i think that straightforward and direct approach has resonated extremely well with consumers and we followed right. this across the board in both our tv advertising um, which is our uh, you know prime uh, uh, media channel or a media uh, uh, device and uh, mm-hmm. and also in our digital marketing strategies where we've looked to be you know uh, expand our reach across various platforms so that mm-hmm. we are visible and backing up all our tv advertising as well right right so there's a here's another point you know um, 90 days has also given us a certain new insight into how you know marketing technology works you know if i have if you have to build the next level of stack the marketing technology stack what would be some of the learnings you know from here from these 90 days that could be part of that also the world is opening up gradually Which, which would also stay relevant in that kind of a world, which is a mix of the two. What would be those elements that could become part of that stack, tech marketing tech stack? Right. So I think you know uh, one of the things that we are constantly endeavouring to do is to try to make it easier and simpler for consumers to find the right product for themselves. Uh, you know, as an aggregator, we present. the customer with all possible choices that are available in the market mm-hmm. but at the same time our endeavor is to build out personalization and customization to a level mm-hmm. which makes it much much more easier for people right. and typically for people who are in the middle of uh, you know the middle class of india because that's mm-hmm. really what we see as the tg for ourselves and right. for this customer often insurance is a little bit of a uh, it's a complex category where they aren't really sure as to what exactly uh, they are buying and right. we are trying to make sure that we are able to present benefits to them of each product 
in a manner that makes it easier for them to make choices to their benefit. Uh, right. As a company, one of the things that's really clear and we, you know, we really strongly believe in is the whole customer first uh, approach to it. And a lot of our tech uh, development is focused in terms of driving a, a, a level of personalization and customization, which right. is able to uh, you know, understand where this customer is coming from, what kind of uh, salary bracket the customer is at, what age bracket they are at, what are their circumstances in life in terms of their, how healthy they are? Do they have a pre-existing right. illness? Therefore, what's the best product that would work for them? And I think right. that, that is really the challenge that every day uh, kind of keeps our engineers and our product people going. Uh, right. that's, that's really what we look to do. So before Sonakshi comes with her question, I have a quick announcement that we are live on Facebook and on, Beard, on, on Zoom. You can post your questions. Uh, we will be glad to ask and pose them to uh, Mr. Dal. Yes, Anaj. Yeah. So actually, I wanted to understand what are the key learnings that you and your organizations ha has kind of like, you know made out of the current situation. Um, there are a lot of, of I mean, of course, insurance has taken a big, uh, uh, they profited if, if right. that's the correct way of putting it out. But what are the key learnings? What is something that you would want to do better for your people? Even a cultural shift, yeah. maybe a cultural yeah. shift at the workplace and all of that. Yeah, absolutely. I think I was just going to say that, that one of the key learnings for us as an organization has been that, uh, you know, the whole uh, uh, work from home has really been something that has been a revelation for us. Uh, as I said, we have about uh, 6,000 telecallers uh, who were, you know, taking calls of customers inquiring about insurance and advising them about, uh, about products. Now, these are young people who typically one thought was not, uh, you know, uh, were not so self-motivated and driven. Uh, and responsible and committed. But it has been a tremendous revelation for us in terms of looking at the kind of performance that we've seen and the kind of productivity that we've seen from, these, uh, from this workforce. And uh, that's what's led us to believe that going forward as well, uh, we probably will always have 30-40% of our workforce uh, uh, working from home. Uh, because we think that uh, a lot of people are, are showing that they are far more productive at home when they don't have to travel an hour and a half or two hours to reach there. Many of them have gone back to their native places and are working from there. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, that's worked out well. So I think it's been a, a tremendous learning on the cultural front. And people are extremely happy about uh, the situation in that sense. Right. I think the learnings from a brand in terms of uh, on the marketing side, I think have been really about, you know, having your ear to the ground and being agile. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you the example of uh, on, the, on the media uh, side, particularly. One of the things that happened as soon as the lockdown happened was that uh, we realized very quickly that uh, one, people were watching more TV, people were watching TV during the day. And two, they were watching news more than, you know, uh, as some of the GEC content went away, it was really a lot of people watching news and we were able to move our money around very, very quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. Doordarshan, you know, came back with Ramayan and, and we, we made a buy on that. That turned out to be a tremendous uh, buy for us because it was, we got IPL like audiences at a fraction of the cost. So uh, I think it was really about being agile, having your ear to the ground, understanding what's going on with the consumer and where the consumer really is at yeah. and making right. quick decisions in terms of changing things. Right. Mr. Dal, uh, what has also happened is that while there is a lot of traffic coming your way, um, is this a perennial uh, scenario? Of course not. When it settles down and you, know, you have a kind of a balanced uh, spread of this traffic, uh, how is your marketing tech going to adjust to it? I mean, from a high spike to a low spike. I mean, what are the features, the readjustments in that kind of a scenario? Have you taken that into account? I'm sure, I mean, that's part of your strategy. But what is that? What would be the features then now? I mean, how do you future proofing it? Right. So I think one of the things that, uh, you know, we do very carefully is there are two things that we are really, really uh, very, very uh, very, very careful about. One is that we uh, measure our marketing spend and the returns from it very, very, uh, you know, uh, closely. And, um, and in that sense, we, we really look at what kind of delivery we get in terms of actual queries that come back from customers. 
So even yeah. TV advertising, we evaluate very, uh, we correlate it with the kind of leads that we are getting on a daily basis and evaluate channels in terms of uh, whether they are working for us or not. So what that also enables us to do is to modulate the amount of media that we are putting out and where that media should be so that we are mm. able to uh, you know, smoothen the peaks and the troughs and not okay. get into a situation where we get so many queries mm. that we are not able to handle mm. it because then at the end of the day, you're only wasting your marketing dollars out there. Uh, right. So, right. so I think that's something that we are very, very careful about. And we, we balance TV and digital spends in a manner that, you know, we're able to uh, smoothen out these kind of uh, peaks and troughs. Right. Uh, tell me about, I mean, uh, uh, this category has been growing, of course, during this uh, pandemic and uh, you've been advertising, especially news channels and all. Uh, if you have to tell me about uh, how the two have behaved differently, the two platforms, the digital and the TV for you, uh, right. especially in the last 90 days, if you could give us a sense of, you know, how it worked for you and what was the impact. Right. So I, I think, uh, you know, as far as digital is concerned, uh, there are, uh, you know, we are, we're always on on search because we really do believe that uh, uh, it, it works really well for us because uh, we are talking to people uh, mm. who are contextually looking for insurance as a category. And, mm. and, and that's something that we then measure back down to leads and conversions and so on and, you know, CPLs and all the numbers that you have. Uh, mm. and, and, and what's also worked well for us during this period is uh, on the digital display side, where we've actually expanded our reach by doing a lot of programmatic ads and, and being able to expand our reach through digital, which would sub, which supplements the TV reach that we were already uh, driving. So I think right. in that sense, um, I would say that uh, as a category, it's a category which requires a bit of persuasion. Uh, and hence, we find that uh, audiovisual message like TV is extremely important for us. So that's why TV is our primary uh, medium of advertising. Mm -hmm. But at the same mm -hmm. time, we find that digital works really well as a support and mm -hmm. ensures that it's a reminder and gets people back. People who have probably come to the site, who've seen the TV ad, etc. Uh, you know, realize that, okay, oh yeah, that was the message. Uh, this is a reminder. I'm back on the site. So, so we tend to use the two uh, very, fairly closely, uh, work closely on the uh, TV side as well as the digital side. So Sharad, how do you think MarTech is really going to change the game after current scenario? Or let's say in the six months, let's not even keep it to COVID, but let's just say like, you know. Uh, you not know. just for you, I mean, the, for the yeah. entire, you know, industry, overall industry, not just your industry overall. Yeah. So I think, you know, this is a, a, a this is a period that uh, is kind of, uh, uh, like I said, absolutely unprecedented and hopefully not uh, never repeated. Uh, I, I think that uh, one of the things that clearly is uh, happening is that customers want messages that are far more personalized. And I think uh, it's, it's, far, it's very, very important for a brand to ensure that they are able to understand where their customers are coming from and what stage of life their customers are in and hence what kind of needs they have. That's the only way that they are able to enable uh, uh, the, the brand to offer suitable solutions. I think, I think that's, that's something that's really important and that is something that you know, can't happen without you being fairly evolved as far as your marketing tech is concerned. Because you really need to be understanding where your visitors having a 360 degree view of people who are visiting your site or engaging with you to understand which platforms they're coming in from. Has that person seen a TV ad before they've come in and visited your site through your uh, mobile website or made a call to the call center? I need to be able to connect all of these things. And I think those are the, those are the challenges that one has as a brand in terms of building out a strong personalization engine, which then provides a much, much better experience for consumers. Right. Actually, yeah, so, that's going to be the, yeah. sorry, Ray. No, no, please, please go on, yes. That was going to be the next question. I mean, how, is there a particular solution that you wish existed, a certain machine or program that could actually take care of all these things? 
well there are tools and uh, you know we are working on some of them uh, some of the stuff that we do is in house in terms of actually uh, looking at all the so we have uh, you know uh, hundreds of thousands of calls and conversations with consumers and uh, we do a lot of data anal analytics on that to really understand you know what consumers are saying to us and what consumers want so there's a team of uh, you know ai and uh, machine learning team that actually works uh, constantly in terms of understanding you know what's the what are the what are the messages that people are telling us in the course of their conversations and what's the sentiment that is emerging on every call so that we are in a better position to understand that after every conversation we have with the customer has that customer moved ahead in their purchase decision or has actually uh, gone backwards you know so that's something that then feeds into our training and our working on the uh, on the telecalling bit as well right um see um, another factor here is that uh, everything is moved online everything and the expectations online have uh, also kind of gone on a notch higher yeah. so in this kind of a scenario uh, you the experience that customers get with your uh, app or you know any you know front facing uh, platform is uh, i mean they expect it much more uh, easier seamless absolutely uh, one is if you can tell me how possible how how much have you made it possible closer to the actual you know touch and feel kind of it do not action but very close to it second is uh, bots and what's the role of bots what's the role of talent here i mean if you can throw a bit yeah. of light on this yeah so i think that's a that's a good point that you make about bots i think uh, there's a lot of work that we do again on the service side particularly uh, with uh, with bots uh, both as far as chatbots are concerned and we are also working uh, you know experimenting with the voice bots as well uh, on the service side because uh, we feel that there is a tremendous opportunity to actually uh, optimize and make more seamless the entire service experience uh, by enabling the customer to have service uh, on the go uh, you know maybe our like for example on the mobile app uh, uh the customer might want to uh have an endorsement on his policy and uh, needs to talk to somebody and it's at 2 am at night uh, like i was saying you know we have younger and younger audiences a lot of them are spend a lot of time awake at night uh, <laughs> and and want to be served at that time now i may not have a tele caller in at that time but my bot may be able to answer those questions so so uh, there there's a lot of uh, stuff that's happening on the on the service end of things uh with regard to the bot on the front end uh, bit i think what you're saying again is absolutely bang on uh, customers are far more uh, you know they their expectations are going up every day and uh, and and they do expect a very very seamless experience uh, and so one of the things you know as an aggregator we sell you know various kinds of insurance all the way from life insurance to health to you know motor and two wheeler and home insurance and corporate insurance so there are a whole plethora of products that are there but one of the things that we endeavor to do for example is to say that okay if you bought a motor policy with me for example uh, and you come and looking for a life insurance policy a month later or six months later i should be able to identify that this is rohel and you know not ask you for the same details that probably you gave me six months back even though it's a completely different line of business and a completely different stream uh, mm. so things like that which try to make it far more seamless so i think you know it's a constant endeavor to try to make it more seamless more personalized uh, more customized in terms of what offerings to show to you uh, when you come to the website based on your the credentials or the or the uh, the, the things that you have already told me about yourself So Sharad there's something that I would like to ask you given the fact that we're talking about CX right now customer experience we're talking about millennials mostly who are a part of your uh, company and the people who are actually purchasing insurance on your platform so how is it that you take care of grievances and complaints for example what kind of technology are you using to you know get to them faster because their attention span is much shorter and they need solutions asap because then otherwise you know people tend to run out and move out so what is it that you're doing to retain them and take care of them on the spot 
right so i think uh, one of the things that you know has worked really well for us is the whole whatsapp uh, the service experience through whatsapp uh, you know through either uh, they chat uh, so there's uh, some uh, you know we've got a bot as well as the regular chat which is there uh, on the whatsapp and and we find that that is something that customers really engage with and uh, you know are uh, we we are able to uh, service their needs better and close out uh, issues much much faster because there's a very quick up and down which happens between the customer and us on a platform like whatsapp so that's something that is really worked well and we've seen that they that the number of people who are engaging with us on whatsapp that percentage share also is increasing uh, day by day so uh, so i think it's 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 all about you know staying in tune with what's happening on the uh, on the on the tech side uh, and taking advantage of all the new platforms that come in and platforms which people are on i think that's that's the most important thing you need to go where the where the customer is at the end of the day okay. great thank you mr dal i mean it's been a wonderful session i think we're out of time sonakshi is it yes we are i was just going to say right. yes. thank you, you. Yes. thank you pleasure talking to you so very interesting thanks nice talking bye thanks thanks bye. thank you All right. Now we move on to the next session for the day. We have with us Mr. Manu Lavanya. He is the director and COO of Max Life Insurance. He is already here. Manu, I won't take much of your time, but let me just do a quick introduction. Manu has more than two decades of valuable experience in successfully creating, transforming, and scaling IT businesses across multiple industry domains and ge- geographies, including the U.S., Latin America, Eastern Europe, U- U.K., and India. He also leads the fulfillment group that comprises operations, information technology, underwriting claims, digital transformation and quality, innovation and service excellence. As the COO, Manu plays an instrumental role in enhancing the operations value chain, leading our digital transformation agenda and uh, strengthening the quality culture thereby helping them craft superior customer experiences. So Manu, welcome on board. You can begin your presentation now. Good evening. Thank you, Sunakshi. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, uh, Martech team, for for this invitation, and uh, really looking forward to uh, to this interaction today. Uh, but very strange times indeed to have this interaction uh, completely virtually. So I think as as the businesses are reinventing, so are these forums on uh, on how do we engage virtually on these platforms to drive the same connect and the same sh- uh, learning and sharing uh, that we did do in the years while. the pre covid world so thank you so much and um, i have a brief presentation that i would like to uh, go ahead with uh, let me know if uh, the presentation is visible and then i can uh, take it forward yes we can see it manu we can see it perfect 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 so uh, when we talk about um, the topic of my presentation digital transformation the new muscle um, i think it's it's less about it being new as a concept but more about why it is the permanent muscle post covid and uh, today in the conversation uh, i would like to really stress upon the max life response to this entire uh, the entire reality of of covid that has surrounded us and how has digital transformation been a vehicle for building permanent long term muscle right uh, in 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 our organization Uh, if if i look at uh, the response curves and um, you know you, you look at gartner gartner comes up with this beautiful three wave model uh, of how businesses have typically responded to uh, to covid if you see the first line of response it was it was really hey save the business sustain right protect it was all about bcp execution how do we drive work from home how do we drive the interactions to really go from in person human touch to digital and then hey brace for the new normal we don't know what the new normal is going to be nobody knows the future how long how deep the impact is going to be uh, just brace for it right and 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 as we settled down in the first quarter um, the thinking was then more shifting towards efficiency like, hey you know what yes we figured out how to work from home we challenged some of very basic uh, very basic assumptions on how to execute business how to reach our customers uh, but then we started looking at hey how do we become more efficient in the new way of working right so hence what is the new customer persona uh, how do we hone the way of working in this new world 
what is the meaning of distributed governance and leadership when everybody is working from home? Uh, if you look at the idea of, uh, of, of governance, uh, it has a very different meaning in a, as far as the post-COVID world is concerned. Uh, infrastructure has a very different meaning as far as post-COVID world is concerned. Now, do we need offices? Do we need people to be getting to a physical facility or it can be a new normal? So the phase two, if I call it the efficiency phase, it was all about adopting the new normal. And then what uh, the organizations are now going forward into is more redefining the new normal. Really redefining, hey, I have looked at the immediate response, the businesses to a similar level of efficiency, but you know what, uh, we need to question some of the very, very fundamentals that COVID questioned for us, right? How do we then transform the business processes to ingrain the new muscle permanently? How do we keep on redefining the new customer persona? How do we keep on redefining the digital persona of the new customer that we'll go after? And then how do we write the new novel, right? So if, if those are the three uh, secular phases of how firms were, were, were responding to the discontinuity of COVID, there was also a customer view or a customer behavior aspect that was also transforming in the pre and post COVID world. Uh, exactly as Sharath was sharing in the, in, in, in the, in the initial um, presentation, uh, the digital maturity of customers also has undergone a change because of COVID. The acceptance of inputs across a very diverse set of channels, be it social media, be it television, uh, has gone up multifold, has gone up, has gone up significantly in the post-COVID world. There is an automatic preference because of, uh, because of uh, uh, apprehension of physical touch, right? There, there's a lot of, um, lot of readiness to adopt the digital means over physical means, which means if you talk about uh, payments, if you talk about document, submitting documents for insurance applications online, if you talk about my ability to do online transactions on my policy vis-a-vis -vis walking into an office and trying to get the service for my policies, that behavior is undergoing a change. The distributors, the, the, the partners, they are trying to drive digital ways of connecting with the customers. They are asking for more and more digital enablement. Hey, you know, initially I was only limited with the, with, with the skill that is available in my office or in my branch, but with digital, can I get the next expert from wherever it is required on the call along with my end customer so I can have better conversion? And the customers were really experiencing this very strong need for convenience. When we talk about uh, customization, we talk about convenience, that need has gone up significantly. And that's where the, uh, the tools of you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, analytics are really coming to bear very strongly to drive that customization and enhance experience in the times of COVID. So what were the challenges that uh, as insurance uh, industry, uh, COVID actually came in and, and challenged some very fundamental status quo of how the insurance practices were, uh, were executed in the past. First, the physical infrastructure, the offices, the walk-ins, uh, the custom branches, daily business operations being executed out of those, those, those physical branches. There was a need for physical documents, and, and, and uh, I must comment even the, the alacrity and the, and, the, and the speed at which even regulation, even IDI as, as a governing body has completely transformed the need for physical documentation, the amount of agility we see in regulation, the agility we see in transforming the business processes to avoid these need of physical documents. But that was the reality before COVID. If you look at the need for in-person interactions, uh, the whole of customer servicing, new business sales, it was truly, truly a, a behavior mindset that uh, it's a very high contact sale. It's a very in-person sale. Some of those, some of those very fundamental uh, assumptions of business have been questioned uh, significantly uh, post-COVID. And finally, you know, insurance being a very complex product, right? The whole mindset, the whole, the whole idea that it requires a physical person to be there, to coach, to mentor the customer through the purchase, because insurance is a very complex uh, product, 
is something that has also been questioned very significantly in the COVID era because now the customers are distanced. How do you convince the customers of a similar sell or similar purchase uh, of such a complex product, but virtually? So COVID did come across and really put a question to some of very long standing beliefs and long standing practices that the industry had. So there was an immediate response to it, which was, hey, let's take the existing business and make it digital, right? And, and when I say the immediate response, it was more about interactions becoming digital than the entire end-to-end -end becoming digital, right? So the first response really was, how do I make all my processes at least digitally enabled end-to-end, -end, right from prospecting to an application of, 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 of uh, you know, a policy down to policy issuance, down to servicing, right? How do we make this entire end end to end process digital so that we can avoid physical paper, physical meeting, and the entire idea of a humanless intervention in the end to end process. The second dimension uh, that the business has really responded to uh, was more around acceleration of digital sales. And, and think of digital sales as, as more digital interactions and digital platforms and digital assets that are brought to bear in converting a prospect. And this led to a lot of quote unquote simplification, but also led to a lot of reinventing because now you have digital pro sales processes where you have multiple people on the same call and the same interaction, you need to tell your uh, sales force about digital etiquettes, uh, even about how to, how, to, how to have a great Zoom call, how to have a great virtual connect with the, with the end customers. How do you bring about great collaterals? How do you bring about great content uh, as a part of the digital interaction that can help you convert? How do you get enabled through, through excellence across the organization when it's brought into that one single digital connect? with the end customer, uh, that really, really uh, became a very secondary agenda for us. Uh, I think within a period of three weeks, the uh, Max Life uh, as an organization completely rewired themselves into the digital, digital mode of selling, right? And, and, and that also led to a lot of learning and breaking a lot of mental barriers with how much really a physical interaction or a physical in-presence uh, is truly required for conversion. Some of those beliefs got challenged. At the same time, uh, as the sales teams grew a lot of more and more traction around digital selling, we saw more and more belief that indeed the amount of tool sets that can be brought to bear, the amount of collaterals that can be brought to bear, the thinking that can be brought to bear in the last mile interaction of a sale uh, can be far, far superior. So when we are talking about digital sales as a, as a process, we are really talking about it as a permanent muscle. We do expect that the, in, in the end, the best practice will somewhere lie as a hybrid in the post-COVID era. Uh, but some of this new muscle around digital sales that we have developed is here to stay. The whole, the whole idea of process digitization and innovation, right? Uh, we talked about, hey, if you can't see the life assured uh, to begin with, you can't meet that person, how do you then drive underwriting? How do you drive um, that, that, that physical um, due diligence that used to happen with the life assured, right? How do you drive digital collection of documents? How do you drive alternatives uh, to, to physical documents? How do you drive alternatives to medical testing? And in fact, one of the one of the, one of the biggest, uh, I would say, change that is happening uh, with COVID as the as, as the medicals uh, did drop down significantly was surrogates of medicals uh, started coming up uh, significantly. Telemedicals, tele MER, video MERs, a technology really coming to rescue as far as developing new surrogates for risk underwriting, right? And 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 that's another big impact. Uh, that was immediately leveraged in the post-COVID uh, era as far as digital interventions were concerned. And finally, uh, but not a small element, uh, virtual work from home. In my view, this idea has both a physical process implica implica implication, but also a culture implication. 
So we, we suddenly came up with all the infrastructure that was required, all those desktops, all the connectivity tools, bandwidth increments that had to happen with our distributed workforce. Uh, I think within a period of about five days, we were able to enable pretty much everybody who was critical for operations to be working from home. But the real question that came is in the, in, in the post uh, COVID world, as people are distributed, how do you drive governance? What does being a leader mean? What does governing a team mean in the context of a distributed virtual uh, uh, workplace? And some of those uh, have formed an immediate response uh, for Max Life to really deal with the secular change that COVID brought about. And if you, if you drill down a little deeper into how it implied for the various proprietary channel, the bank, banker channel as well as online, you will see that both in terms of the purchase, the customer interaction or our internal employee and, and, and uh, agent engagement, multiple, multiple immediate steps that were required that were put in place, uh, be it digital sales journeys, be it uh, complete, you know, uh, transformation of learning through video learning modules, through e-learning platforms, uh, driving more and more self-service options, right? Driving more and more uh, uh, solutions, driving more and more capability for customers to not only self-serve their policies, but also self-serve the buying process itself. Uh, significant amount of transformation has happened in the last quarter um, as far as enabling all the three constituent channels, online, banker, as well as proprietary channels uh, with our digital interventions. Uh, now, what I've shared till now uh, is truly the immediate response, but uh, the whole idea of today's conversation is also to see digital as a permanent muscle. So what COVID did do was really, it, it, it set us into a view that we have to develop a much broader and a holistic view of digital transformation. If, I, if we were to truly, truly look at COVID in the post-COVID world, that being a permanent muscle, right? And, and, and when you talk about this, we, we talk about these six dimensions of digital transformation um, um, very, very often within Max Life. And a lot of, a lot of the, the levers that you see here, empowerment, emotional connect, responsiveness, a lot of this is to do with the change customer experience expectation and also a change in persona of customer. I think, I, I, I think Mr. Chair talked about the millennial mindset. I want to be empowered. I want to feel that I'm in control of the process. I want to feel emotionally connected once I go through a buying process, even if it is completely online. There is a huge, there is a huge propensity for instant gratification. I want it now. I want to give a feedback to you right away when I consume the service. I can't wait for my policy documents to come to me in three weeks. Sorry, it's not done. I want it now. I want my policy to get to me no more than an hour from when I put the last click for submitting my documents, right? So there are secular consumer behaviors that are truly driving the three levers of transformation that I call intelligence, speed, and experience. When you look at what COVID is going to do for our processes internally, we are going to leverage extensively the use of machine learning, artificial intelligence, even for figuring out how do you do risk management? How do you do underwriting? How do you do uh, intent prediction for people to pay uh, their renewals, right? So there is a lot of behavior change that is happening uh, as far as need for personalization and pervasive and ubiquitous experience need uh, that is coming from a consumer personas to drive the intelligence quotient of our, of our processes. So what does, it, what does that framework mean on how Max Life is trying to build that permanent new muscle? When you look at intelligence, uh, truly when you look at the segment of one, right? first, how do I really discover new segments of customers, of digital native customers, who can be better targeted, for example, using your online channels? How do I drive better surrogates of financial or medical data for what I call as distant underwriting, right? Where uh, we don't need to meet the life, the, the life assured, 
uh, it's a question of applying analytics, machine learning, um, even even from a video, uh, getting to know whether the, what's, what is it, the expected life expectancy of a person, whether a person is a smoker. There are amazing tool sets available today leveraging AI that can do a lot of surrogates as far as underwriting is concerned. What are the next best actions that can be recommended through, through machine learning uh, when you try to do cross sales, especially doing renewals in these days, right? Uh, how do we drive that, that, sort of an, that sort of an intelligence into our, into our self-service models, into our renewals teams, so they can actually drive an uplift through a cross sell while these renewals are being made in these days. Frictionless journeys, I talked about the whole need for an amazing customer experience that is emanating from, from the post-COVID experience. How do we really leverage digitization, OCRs, to the extent where the onboarding journey of my customers becomes completely seamless, right? How do I do a straight through underwriting? We have, we have actually started an initiative uh, called Insta6 on, on figuring out what portion of our policies can actually be issued in six minutes without any human intervention, end to end. That is a type of play technology and especially digital transformation overall can play in completely rewiring, completely rewriting the issuance process. As we discussed in the previous presentation, scaling WhatsApp document chase for faster the document collections. How do you use hyper interactive platforms like, well, like WhatsApp for doing self-servicing, enterprise servicing, digital delivery of policy documents, automation, right? If, if, if you look at the whole document flow in terms of risk analytics for, for underwriting, if you look at the whole customer service calling, right? How can we seamlessly drive what I call as a digital hybrid human experience because uh, not everything can be 100% digital. There's also a big human component and I do very frankly believe that COVID puts up in a world where only digital is not the response. Uh, it has to be the right hybrid of emotion and the hybrid of efficiency, both brought together in this, in this human digital hybrid interaction, if you would say, right? And how does that drive better servicing, better, cus better customer connect? and better customer intent prediction, uh, be it payments, be it collections, and so on and so forth. And finally, uh, all that needs a very much a digital core around how we do we look at our systems internally, cloud first, mobile first, uh, digitally empowering our employees and our agents, training uh, the whole data strategy. All these, all these parameters, all these dimensions come to play in truly setting up a foundation that is required for building up for a higher experience or intelligence paradigm. And hence, what strategic choices uh, that Max Life is driving today, uh, has taken today? One, fluid architecture. We are moving to open source technology. We are putting the idea of cloud, APIification, responsive design in all our architectures, uh, truly driving a unified customer platform, a unified interaction platform, where you can you can really develop a 360 degree view, but then also you can take all the transactions of a customer while onboarding in one single window, right? To give the seamless experience to somebody who's getting onboarded. Uh, a very very clear strategy on build versus buy. We believe that COVID has really raised a great question around what will cause or what will drive competitive advantage going forward. And we believe that it is the, this intelligence built into our processes. It is this experience built into our processes that will be the sustainable competitive advantage going forward rather than just the product itself or rather than just the placement itself or selection itself. Truly building a cognitive enterprise, uh, there is extensive amount of strategy shift in MaxLife towards driving intelligence, automation, AI, uh, and really questioning each and every workflow and seeing how the workflow can become more cognitive, how it can become more simple, intuitive, but yet drive intelligence at each point of the customer journey. How do you drive, and finally, how do you drive and modernize the entire legacy that is there? Because uh, it's not easy for, for firms uh, of, of, this, you know, of, uh, of, of this particular segment to really just do away with legacy, right? So it's also a question of, yes, there will be legacy, there will be legacy systems that are the core backbone engines, but then how do you drive 
or create a fluid service wrapper around those legacy so that the end customer experience or end business and employee experience when consuming those legacy applications is still very modern, is still very contemporary, uh, even though the applications themselves may be legacy in architecture, right? So the four pillars that we have tried to use leverage it at, at Max Live extensively. That was a very quick view from my side in terms of uh, the, the Max Live response to building the new muscle. Uh, love to get any questions. Thank you, Mr. Lavanya. Yes, wonderful uh, presentation. And we do have a lot of questions. Uh, we have uh, around four minutes, so we'll try to pack in a couple of them. One of the questions is that, you know, if you see your category, what has worked when I talk about advertising, for example, we have played on the fear factor a lot, you know, in our communication always. Uh, one is that, why has it been that way? Uh, second is in the last 90 days, if you have to tell me about uh, digital and other mediums, uh, where is it most effective? Uh, what, is, what is the way it is working? Which way is it going? Great, great questions, Rohel. And uh, let me respond to the first one. See, if, you, if I will not say fear factor as such, because if I see the strategy of Max Life in terms of our disposition towards protection as a strategy, right? That disposition was there almost even two years ago, right? Very, very, very early because of severe underpenetration of protection in our, in, in our country, right? We almost mm. felt a sense of obligation uh, right. to, educate, to bring about a better, better um, education in a customer base. There is a need, there is a need for us to be protected, right? So right. it has been less been driven by the fear of COVID than as a secular strategy on the importance of being protected uh, in the context of India, in the context of the lesser amount of penetration, right? That, that's uh, on, on the first, first part. Mm. On the second question around the last quarter, if I look around and say digital, which segments have taken really well? See, definitely my online business, for sure, is seeing a much, much significant higher traction as compared, you know, comparatively in the pre-COVID, as compared to pre-COVID. Right? Significant right. amount of traction. Uh, there's a significant amount of traction uh, in the protection term business itself. In mm -hmm. fact, we are almost writing 300% more policies and term in pure protection as we were writing, let's say, in the pre-COVID world, right? So, so there is a significant uh, change in the in the in the persona as well. Mm -hmm. And when I look at persona of online um, uh, online behavior, the online customers, the digital natives are definitely finding it. Uh, more compelling now to use online mediums of uh, insurance purchase. Okay. Manu, I have a question. Let's go beyond machines for a minute and talk about, you know, what, what do you think is happening with the customer's mind right now? Are they like anxious and fearful or are they optimistic about things that are really going to happen? Are they going to change soon? Is it something that companies basically focusing on and, you know, changing for the people out there? Great, great question, Sunakshi. And, and, and to be very candid, See, we do see there is there is there, there was a lot of anxiety for sure in the month of April, right? Uh, one good measure of anx consumer anxiety that we see is uh, what do you hear when you make that call for collection, right? Uh, uh, the, the the if you if you look at the word word clouds over the last three months, they have significantly changed, right? The first day was hey, don't call me, hey, bad time, <laughs> I'm not even thinking about insurance, uh, don't bother me, please. Right? right and slowly as the reality of permanence of this issue came in people's heart right hey i was trying to wish it away uh, not going to wish it wish it away it's going to stay in my life maybe for a year maybe for 18 months we don't know that has slowly started uh, uh, switching our consumer mindset from the first shock and awe phase to more of hey so now what do i do face right and that's when I've seen my collection rates coming back. We have seen our, 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 our renewals uh, coming back. And, and today, yes, there is a lot of anxiety still. It's not that my customer is waiting out there with a check in the hand and saying, hey, you know what? I'll spend the first thing I'll spend is on, is on insurance. That's not right, right? But I see a far more weighted and a far more deliberate um, uh, effort from my consumers to really persist on their journey of protection to persist on their journey of life insurance as a basket of their spending, right? So that, that behavior is gradually changing over the last three months, but I can tell you the first few days were very challenging. Right, right. Thank you, Mr. Lavanya. Do we have time, Sonakshi? Sorry, your, your audio is muted. We have one more question. 
just last one what is your process of adding new marketing vendors example what can vendors who are good in healthcare prediction partner with max life it's a question by vikram kumar sure see you see when we look at partners for driving our messaging i think, I think the first the, the, one of the few idea or few paradigms that we use is 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 the partner able to get the the strategic intent and the essence mm -hmm. of the positioning that we want to do right or what is the idea that we are after right and how because in the context of marketing insurance in india it is not an easy marketing marketing concept right because we are talking about a fairly complex interaction that happens right so what the first is is the person is, is is the agency or is the partner able to visualize how we see protection and insurance in the context of our indian customers right that that's one number one number two uh, we have a very very broad channel spectrum and we want the partner to understand the nuances of building a campaign that is equally appealing to all those channels so, uh, we don't want to prioritize one channel or the other right so, although we have a great strategy towards prior, uh, proprietary channels but the messaging the marketing messaging that is built has to be relevant and appealing to customers across all those channels right so, the, so that understanding of channel behavior is also a big big plus uh, in terms of uh, choosing marketing customer, marketing partners thank you mr lavanya i think we are out of time it has been a wonderful presentation and a lot of learnings for everyone who has joined in thank you again for your time thank you thank you so much thank you manu thank you all right ladies and gentlemen now we move on to the keynote se keynote session of the day we have with us scott brinker he will be talking about the new rules of marketing technology and operations and of course i do not really need to introduce him because the name is synonymous with martech the name that the world looks up to for insights and advice on martech we have with us scott brinker scott just a short uh, introduction for you he requires no introduction really but i'll really do that briefly he's the editor of chief martech uh, chief martech marketing technologies blog author of best selling book hacking marketing the conference chair for the martech conference in the us the hubspot vp platform ecosystem and most importantly the brains behind the annual marketing technology landscape super graphic a monumental visualization of the global martech vendors this year uh, this yearly release has grown exponentially from a hum humble 150 inclusions in 2011 to a massive to 8000 in the current scenario in 2020 and it's still counting over to you scott Thank you. Uh, wow, uh, the very very kind introduction. It is a pleasure to be with all of you here. Let me share a presentation. Um, I apologize. I am not on video. Uh, I'm a technical difficulty there on my end. Um, but uh, I promise we'll make the uh, slides themselves quite exciting. All right. Should be good. The new rules of marketing technology and operations. um so i i won't rehash uh, the introduction uh, thank you very much i think um yeah i could summarize as just say yeah i've been uh, living breathing eating sleeping marketing technology here for uh, uh well over a couple of decades and um yeah for better and worse i am known as the person behind this crazy landscape of all these different marketing technologies and so maybe this is a, a a good place to start because you know there's been so much change and transformation in marketing uh over the uh um oops hang on here let me just make sure um uh, uh yeah uh, yeah there's been so much change in marketing over the past 10 years in particular but it's actually somewhat hard to quantify the change right we know we've we've been living through this incredible amount of disruption um but uh yeah how do you actually quantify that and i think that's one of the interesting things about the martech landscape while it only represents a sliver of the change that we have gone through uh to have seen this progression from yeah a couple hundred tools you know 10 years ago to uh, now over 8000 it really does give you a sense of just the magnitude of how much digital technology has exploded uh, within the marketing domain um i mean if we go back from 2011 up to this year we're talking about 
5,233% growth. I mean, <laughs> you, you mentioned in the intro, uh, exponential growth. This is exponential growth, orders of magnitude. Uh, really incredible. Um, you know, and if we just take, uh, you know, this year's landscape and some of the stats, yeah, it, it, it hit an actual even 8,000, uh, which was 13.6% growth from 2019. Um, people always tell me about consolidation in the industry. Uh, you know, why does this keep growing? Aren't, aren't companies being acquired? Don't companies go out of business? Uh, and the answer is, of course they get acquired. Of course they go out of business. We had like 615 companies that were removed uh, from the previous year's landscape and this one. But the thing is, there are just no barriers to entry in the software world anymore, right? I mean, anyone leveraging, you know, cloud uh, technologies, uh, you know, from like AWS and Microsoft and Google, um, open source libraries, um, you know, distributed talent all over the world. I mean, anyone can launch a software idea at this point. Uh, and so you keep seeing this incredible churning forward of new technology and new innovation. Um, just to give you a sense, I mean, some, another question I often get asked is like, okay, well, which category is growing? Uh, and, and the truth is they're all growing. Uh, you know, there hasn't been one where there hasn't been innovative growth, uh, you know, year over year. Um, you know, some grow more than others. Uh, you know, for instance, there's just a tremendous amount of entrepreneurial energy and creativity being applied to the challenges of data. Uh, if we drill into like the most... Uh, the fastest growing category within each one of those. Um, yeah, like in data, the, all the challenges around governance and compliance and privacy, uh, there's a tremendous amount of innovation happening there as well too. Uh, you know, like social relationships, we know that uh, uh, conversational marketing and uh, chat and voice and uh, yeah, all these new modes of interacting with our customers, our audience uh, has just, yeah, been, been growing at a tremendous rate. So I want to pull back from that a bit, though, because while the technology landscape is fascinating and we could spend easily 45 minutes and barely scratch the surface of all the technologies that are out there, I want to shift a little bit more into the transformation that's happening within the marketing department itself. And it certainly starts with this technology, right? You know, when, when senior marketers first started being presented with this idea of a marketing stack, you know, the reaction was really like, okay, we're in marketing. We don't need to think about a stack of software. Um, and then when the conversation kept coming up and people kept showing my crazy graphic, you know, it, it would provoke anger. In fact, even today it provokes anger in some people of like, would you just stop showing us that? You know, it freaks us out. Okay, so <laughs> fair enough. Um, then there's the bargaining stage uh, where, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, some vendors will, will try and help support this mode of thinking of like, oh, okay, yes, yes, it's a crazy landscape out there. But if I just buy everything from one vendor, whew, I'll be all set. Of course, then that stage tends not to last long because, yeah, there was just too much happening in the world at this point. There was too much innovation in marketing. No one vendor can do it all, you know. And so people then have to go back to thinking about this heterogeneous landscape um, and yeah, they're, they're, it's, you know, if you feel frustrated or depressed sometimes, you know, adapting to that, it's a very natural feeling. This is a lot of change. But the good news is, I've seen this again and again, companies get through to the other side. Marketing teams get to this stage of acceptance where they realize actually, hey, this is the state of marketing today. And as you start to get you know, embrace it, it turns out it's actually pretty cool. This is a wonderful time to be a marketer. You know, you have all these companies who are investing all this energy and brain power and creativity, all to create, you know, like better tools to put in your hands for you to create these masterpieces. Um, this is very much the golden age of marketing. You know, and it's not just about technology. I mean, the role of marketing has really been growing over these past few years, right? It's no longer just, as uh, someone once said, uh, the arts and crafts department, right? You know, marketers are taking the lead with customer experience. 
Uh, they're stepping up to the lead of being able to prove return on investment uh, for marketing activities. Um, and so this is actually the context in which we think about marketing technologies. How does it help us achieve these very large missions? So how do we <laughs> do that? It's a great question. Um, there's a friend of mine on Twitter who, uh, you know, was asked, uh, yeah, you know, like what's the difference between, you know, companies, marketing departments that succeed at this, you know, and those who don't? Uh, and his uh, really short response was, oh, well, it really just comes down to two things, focus and plumbing. You know, plumbing kind of being the uh, operations and technology side of this. And I, and I like the clarity of this statement. I'm not entirely sure that I like the metaphor of plumbing. It sort of implies <laughs> maybe what we're delivering through marketing isn't necessarily what uh, we would like to you know, aspire to deliver through marketing. Um, so I'd like to give you a different framework. I would like to share with you the new rules of marketing technology and operations. How does a marketing company succeed in this environment? Um, and it really comes down, I think, to five simple rules. If you're leading marketing ops, marketing technology, first you want to do is centralize everything you can, right? Data, systems. Uh, based on that centralization, you then want to be able to automate everything you can. They don't call it marketing automation for no reason, right? Tremendous amount of automation innovation happening. Now things get tricky because you also want to be able to decentralize everything you can and start to push things out to the edge of the organization and empower a much wider set of participants. You wanna humanize everything you can. The human dimension of marketing and connecting with an audience and your customers can't be uh, understated. And as you're wrestling with that, yeah, you have to just embrace that we live in a world now of continuous change and you really need to design for that. Now, I know if you're thinking of those five and maybe scratching your head, you're not alone. Uh, Augie Ray, who is one of the most distinguished analysts at Gartner, uh, when I had shared this framework, he said, you just put automate everything you can and humanize everything you can two places from each other. I can't decide if that's funny or sad. Uh, so <laughs> thank you, Augie. Um, to which I responded, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. So let's talk about holding some of these ideas, uh, opposing ideas in mind at the same time. Are they really opposing? So centralized versus decentralized, right? We think more of one is less of the other. That's a very natural assumption. But it turns out, particularly with marketing technology, there's a whole bunch of examples where we are doing both simultaneously. I'll give you some concrete examples. Let's start with the oldest marketing technology on the planet, content management systems, right? Everyone has to have a website. That's where this all began. Um, when you think about CMS, or as they're more fancily called these days, digital experience platforms, um, you know, it's a big centralization uh, capability, right? You centralize this content repository, you have brand approved templates, you know, the workflow is controlled, you know, according to uh, whatever rules and processes, you know, the central marketing organization needs. But at the same time, putting that structure and guardrails in place also tends to empower a tremendous number of other people throughout the marketing organization to be able to contribute content in blogs or to leverage landing pages and campaigns, uh, to be able to run A-B tests on their very, uh, you know, uh, localized, um, you know, uh, campaigns and programs. And so a great CMS is both helping you with centralization and helping you with decentralization. And we see this pattern throughout a lot of marketing technology, customer data platforms, right? One of the hot topics these days, right? It's about centralizing customer data, being able to align it among a common customer identity. But at the same time, one of the big features of CDPs is how they integrate with so many disparate tools that are either generating data or wanting to use data. So while it's a centralized data platform, it's also actually empowering more decentralized use of other marketing technology tools. Uh, 
I mean, you see this with things as simple as like Google Sheets, right? You know, I mean, if a company standardizes on, you know, Google G Suite, um, then uh, great, okay, that's a, there's a certain benefit of that standardization, being able to share this among all the participants within the company. But at the same time, it's all about empowering individuals and teams to create their own sheets, you know, their own documents and to collaborate without having to get all sorts of centralized coordination or approval. There's even a really fascinating category of things called APAS, Application Platform as a Service, low-code, no-code tools. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but it's the same pattern. A centralized platform that's empowering a lot of individuals to be able to do more things on their own. All right, so let's look at this other, um, so you're with me, right? Like centralization, decentralization, you, you can actually do both at the same time, and that's kind of cool. So what about automation and bringing the human dimension to marketing? Can we do these at the same time too? So one of the things about automation I find fascinating is uh, there's, a, there's an old Disney movie back from like the 1940s, uh, Fantasia. Uh, and in one of the skits in that uh, you know, animated movie, Mickey Mouse uh, is this apprentice of a sorcerer. The sorcerer goes out, Mickey Mouse gets the master's wand and magically starts having the brooms uh, do his chores for him. And he's like, oh wow, this is great. Automation is so good. But then what happens is, you know, the same automation keeps repeating again and again at scale, you know, and suddenly all these brooms just mindlessly doing the same automation end up like destroying, you know, the wizard's tower. Same automation, but it instantly went from good to bad. Now, if you're wondering, <laughs> listening to me, um, uh, well, I mean, yeah, that's a cartoon. It's not like we in marketing would ever have these like mindless automations that would like go badly. <sighs> then you've never been on the wrong end of like a email nurturing campaign that's gone awry. Uh, it is very easy to leverage automation to create bad outcomes inadvertently. But that's not to say that automation is bad and that we should turn away from that, no. It's just we have to work harder at finding the human in highly efficient automation. And it's, it's there, you just have to, you have to look closely. So I wanna give you one example. Um, this is my daughter, uh, Jordan, uh, from a couple years ago, actually. We, uh, we took her to her first concert, uh, a Taylor Swift concert. So d don't, don't hold it against me, you know? I mean, <laughs> you wanna talk about influencer marketing. I, mean, I assure you, like, you know, 10-year-old girls, highly powerful influence marketers. Um, so we purchased tickets like months in advance, uh, had to like mortgage the house to, you know, purchase tickets to this concert, it's crazy. Anyways, so I got a note when I first purchased them, an email like, okay, you're set, you know, uh, concerts in a few months. So the day of the concert, I go to the email, I click through the link to get the tickets and something goes wrong. It, it, it says, no, your tickets aren't available here. So I then try and call them up on the phone. I end up in some voicemail system, a voice, uh, you know, uh, uh, a response system. Um, it's funny, I actually go through all that process and then they ask me for my credit card that I use to purchase the tickets in an automated fashion. Unfortunately, the credit card I'd used to purchase the tickets was one of the credit cards that had been like, you know, leaked in some data breach. So the bank had destroyed that credit card months ago and given me a new one. So I no longer had the original credit card number for this. So I'm trying to like get through this voice, you know, response system and it, it won't accept any number I give it. I try and ask for an operator. It tells me to just please enter the number, please enter the number. So I give up on that. I go to the website. You know, luckily there's a chat bot on the website. I'm like, okay, great. Maybe, you know, I, I, know, I know chat bots. This is what I do for a living. So, you know, I go into the chat bot and I'm like number 60 in the queue. You know, meanwhile, my daughter's like, so dad, when are we uh, going to be leaving for the concert here? <laughs> like, any minute now. Um, so after like waiting a really long time, finally I get through to someone on the chat bot. They're like, no, 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 we can't help you. You need to use, uh, call this other phone number. I call this other phone number, you know, I, 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 I could actually go on to this story for another 10 minutes. I went through every single technological touch point, their website, their mobile app, their chat bot, their voice system. And none of these things were connected together. None of them were able to help me. I mean, I ultimately got in because I ended up like pleading with 
someone in person at the box office. You know, but to me, this was a perfect example of all this incredible marketing technology that somehow the way it got put together did not have mechanisms for the humanity to escape this automation loop. And so I was thinking about this like framework between when we think about automating things, are we automating things to make them efficient for the customer or are we automating them to make them efficient for the company? And these are two very different things, right? So if we have things that aren't efficient for the, the customer or the company, the technical term for that is crappy. Uh, and there's a lot of crappy experiences in business. We know this. Obviously, what we want to be is in the upper right, right? We want an experience that's delightful for the customer and efficient for the company. That would be fantastic. In some cases, I would argue there are things that can be delightful and efficient for the customer that might not actually be efficient for the company, but there are cases when we want to do that anyway, because those are those magic moments where you can build brand loyalty. You can help someone in an exception and really, yeah, win a, win a customer for life. The one that is scary, and we see this exploding all over business these days, is this implementation of technology that creates efficiencies for the company without actually improving the experience for the customer. In fact, actually, right, given my Taylor Swift concert example, actually makes it much less efficient for the customer to be able to get things done. And it's so easy in implementing technology to fall into this trap because, you know, I mean, the metrics we measure the most are these internal efficiency metrics. And I really believe this is one of the primary missions of marketing technology and operations leaders is to champion the customer in the implementation of this technology to make sure we do not fall into this dangerously efficient trap. There's a saying among, you know, like uh, scouts, uh, you know, the map is not the train. Just because something is printed on the map doesn't actually mean that's what's physically there. Uh, I, I would modify that and say in marketing, uh, the uh, marketing automation platform, the map is not the customer. What you're seeing in your marketing automation platform is not actually the human being on the other side. And just as the scouts will tell you, like when the map and the train disagree, <laughs> trust the train, right? Don't just keep walking off the cliff because the map said it was fine. Um, we really need to have this human dimension in the marketing org broadly so that when the map, the marketing automation platform and the customer disagree, you can trust the customer. I'll give you one, one quick example. So um, uh, one of the telecommunications companies here in the US, uh, T-Mobile, actually did a campaign about a year or so ago where you're going to love this. The promise they were making was there would be a phone number and you as a customer could call this phone number and, all right, hang on, a human being would answer the phone. Not a voice response system, a human being. And they promised that human being would not transfer you to some other place. That human being would stay with you to actually do whatever needed to be taken to resolve the problem. I mean, when you think about it, right? I mean, this is not exactly like state of the art, you know, technology, but in a way it is, right? Because it's not like those operators um, weren't leveraging marketing technology. I assure you they were leveraging state of the art customer relationship management technology on their side but they were presenting it through a human interface and they were really speaking to what they knew the pain point was for the customer. That is how you balance this automation technology and the human side of things. So we have about 20 minutes or so. What I'd like to do is dig a little bit deeper into this. I'd like to share with you a framework I've worked on with some people for what does this actually mean? for a marketing operations, marketing technology leader. Um, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll take these two axes of centralized and decentralized, automate and humanize, and we'll put them up against each other. Um, you know, centralized is about scale, decentralized is about agility, automation is how we harness technology, humanize is, you know, how we work with people. And if you look at the four quadrants that we get from this two by two, I would say, right, the, the upper left is really about efficiency. The upper right is about innovation. 
the lower left is about brand and the lower right is about authenticity on that brand. And so we'll walk through a bunch of very specific examples of what people are doing in each of those categories. Let's start with uh, the upper left because when we think about marketing technology and operations, this is probably the quadrant that we most naturally think of, right? Okay, well, you're centralizing these systems, you're leveraging automation. Uh, and indeed, there's a lot of great work to be done here, right? This is where we standardize on common tools. Uh, this is sometimes called rationalizing your marketing stack. So all the tools you need, none of the tools you don't. Uh, one of the things I do every year is run a kind of a contest called the Stackies, where I invite marketers to send in a slide that illustrates how they think of their marketing tech stack, the different tools they use and the way they work together. Uh, over the years, we've had, uh, yeah, hundreds of submissions, uh, some from some really great companies. I'll share a few uh, in the presentation here, but like Cisco, you know, has entered the Stackies three years in a row. And it's great to actually see how they think, you know, it's not just what tools do they use, but it's how do they think about leveraging those tools in different stages of the customer journey, how they think about it mapping to different capabilities for the organization. Uh, and if you Google MarTech Stackies, all these things are up on SlideShare. You can get a really, uh, yeah, there's a lot to learn from there. So we standardize on tools. We also standardize on data, right? Most important thing is identity. Uh, we need to be able to recognize the customer, uh, regardless of the touch point that they happen. Uh, you know, in marketing operations, we think a lot about standardizing processes. We even think a little bit about almost how do we platformize the marketing department. Where things start to get more interesting, I think, is when we're like, okay, so all this technology is great from a centralization Cap uh, perspective, but how do we start to decentralize some of these capabilities? How do we empower teams for local experiments and workflows, things that are not global? How do we make it okay for certain teams who are doing specialized work to bring their own tools for that specialized work? And in doing so, how do we think about, okay, if you bring your own tools for something, how do we make sure that we're sharing the right amount of data between those tools and the centralized systems to keep things aligned? One category I'm absolutely fascinated with is this rise of what has been called citizen developers, citizen data scientists, citizen integrators, which <laughs> it's kind of a fascinating thing. It's not, it's not like a government thing. Uh, it's, a, um, it's this idea of non-technical professionals, like marketers, being able to do things that previously required a technical professional, right? Like you needed a software developer, you needed a data scientist. How much of this can you put in the hands of ordinary business people? Uh, another favorite uh, Disney uh, Pixar movie, I uh, like uh, Rat Tattooey. You know, anyone can cook. Well, um, I'm, I'm going to try and prove to you that anyone can develop, integrate, analyze. And if you're a little bit skeptical of this, that's that's fine. I'm I'm, I'm going to walk you through it, uh, and I'm going to try and convince you that pretty much every single one of you is a software developer today. You just might not know it. All right, so let's look at, over time, the amount of app-like functionality, the ability to create app-like functionality that has been in marketers' hands. We'll start with Excel. Um, if, if I was doing this presentation in person, I would ask you to raise your hand. How many of you know how to use Excel? And I pretty much guarantee you, even without being able to see you through the video screen here, I know pretty much all of you would raise your hand. Everybody knows how to use Excel, right? This was marketing technology before there was marketing technology. Well, something interesting happened in the past decade, right? All these spreadsheets that used to be isolated on your desktop have ended up in the cloud. So like say Google Sheets is one example. Um, and one of the things that's interesting about Google Sheets is not only can people collaborate on the same sheet at the same time, but like Google hooked this up to something called Google Forms. And Google Forms lets you publish a form out on the web to collect some data and then pipe that data directly into a Google Sheet. And when you think about it, that is a crude and simple app, right? It's so, I have a little interface, I collect some data, I put it into my little database of spreadsheet. All right, interesting, limited, but interesting. 
Well, then along comes a whole nother category of tools called Integration Platform as a Service, IPaaS. Uh, and there's about a hundred of these tools out there now. Uh, one of the most popular ones is uh, something called Zapier. Uh, and uh, the idea of Zapier is it connects to all like 2,000 different cloud applications. And in Zapier, without being a programmer, without being a technician, you can say, oh, well, when this trigger happens in this tool, like somebody fills out, you know, like a form on an email, I then want to trigger that information and route it into some other cloud app. You know, maybe my marketing automation system or my CRM or Slack. In fact, one of the things you can route this to is Google Sheets. So you can pipe data from any cloud app into Google Sheets. And for that matter, you can take data from uh, Google Sheets and pipe it into any other cloud app. You know, and none of this you need a software engineer for. So all of a sudden, now any marketer, frankly, can like trigger the way data and actions are happening all across their stack. And we have only been leaning into this as an industry. There's a whole collection of tools like Airtable and AppSheet. AppSheet was actually just recently acquired by Google. Smartsheet, Salesforce Lightning Object Creator, all these like spreadsheet interfaces that if you can use a spreadsheet, you can create an app. Um, in fact, actually one example, you love this, is uh, there's a product called Glide, glide.app, um, that literally you fill out a spreadsheet it turns it into a native iOS or a native Android app for you. So I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, as I said at the beginning, if, if, if you know how to use Excel, and I think all of you do, congratulations, you are all software developers. You can all go publishing apps uh, in the app store at this point. This transformation is incredible, right? We're taking things that used to be in the hands solely of discipline experts like IT and software development. We've slowly extended that capability to domain experts like marketing technology, marketing operations leaders. But now we're getting into the realm where power users and eventually almost any business user can harness this. You know, and so this has been this, this transformation specifically in the marketing department, you know, of control moving from just the IT department to increasingly a blend of IT and marketing, and again, giving more and more individual marketers this capability. And this is kind of where you get, in my view of the citizen developer movement, you know, this is where that overlays in the marketing world. And so I spent 10 years talking about the transition of power from IT to marketing operations, and that was a big transformation. I'm telling you, we are now starting a second transition from things that went marketing technology specialists to increasingly anyone in marketing being able to leverage much more of this capability. And this is going to be huge. All right, let me back up to uh, this framework here. Um, let's talk about the human side of things. So on the decentralization side, you know, this really isn't about technology. It's about, it's about empowerment. You know, it's about giving individuals the ability to do the right thing. You know, when, when we talk about marketing empowerment, I think it's also important to recognize this isn't just like the marketing department because anything that touches the customer, you know, in sales or customer service or our, the product and service we're offering, right, that impacts marketing with a lowercase m. It, it's the perception people have of us uh, you know, in our market. Um, and so empowering people on the front line of not just marketing, but sales and customer service to have these levers for empathy and intuition and to be able to, as we said earlier, you know, like when the marketing automation system and the customer disagree, trust the customer, um, you know, and for marketing operations and marketing technology leaders, I think one of the things you can do is lean into yeah, getting out from, you know, behind your stack uh, and going to visit, visit customers. Really understand the way they engage with you anthropologically in their natural environment because that will help you think about how you support that with your technology implementations. You know, and, and there is some technology that's coming out in this area that's very exciting, this ability to, um, you know, leverage uh, machine learning to help detect 
customer experience anomalies, uh, you know, throughout digital journeys. Um, some cool stuff there. But again, I really think what this comes down to is empowering humans. And so then when we start to think about centralizing the human dimension to this, we realize, okay, how do we empower humans at scale? You know, well, one of them is marketing enablement. Now, you all know sales enablement, right? Anyone in marketing has, you know, uh, right, been in the business of uh, creating content and materials to help salespeople sell, right? Sales enablement. Marketing enablement is about creating content and training and materials to help people throughout the organization be able to leverage this marketing technology stack. I mean, this is a challenge. We did a survey about a year or so ago where, you know, two thirds of the companies we talked to said they didn't believe they had the skills or talent to make the most use of marketing technology, two thirds. And if I'm being honest, I think the other third was just a little bit delusional, uh, right? I mean, this is, this is, there's a lot out here. There's a lot to learn. Anyone who thinks they've mastered this, um, yeah, come and teach the rest of us. Um, so companies are leaning into this. Uh, you know, one example uh, uh, is Airbnb. Uh, so one of the things Airbnb did was they built this incredible data decision-making infrastructure. You know, so they pull in all this data, they have all these tools to be able to analyze the data, and they really empowered everyone in the organization to leverage those tools to make data-driven decisions. Well, then they realized, actually, because, you know, I mean, as they were growing, they were hiring all these people, they realized, actually, most of the people they were hiring didn't know how to make good data-driven decisions, you know? And it wasn't just about how to use the tool, it was how to think about what you wanted the tool to do for you. And so they created a data university inside Airbnb to teach everyone as they came in, how do you do really great data-driven decision-making? This is marketing enablement. Uh, and Airbnb actually shared a bunch of the stories of this uh, on uh, Medium. So uh, yeah, if you Google them, uh, you can learn a lot about how they approach that. So it's not just about marketing enablement. It's, again, we're talking about empowering people, which comes down to, listen, you can't just tell people they can do whatever they want, right? You need some sort of guardrails. You need some sort of governance. But it's this idea about enlightened governance is, you know, how do you give people as much empowerment, you know, while still keeping the coherence to the organization? And this gets you into things like your customer code and your culture code, you know, like the foundations of how the principles by which you live and operate your business internally and externally. And the reason I put them here is because this is part of what marketing operations and marketing technology leadership needs to concern itself with. Understanding the customer code and the culture code, contributing to it, and then finding ways to make sure that our marketing operations infrastructure is supporting those values. All right, so the last piece of this, actually, we kind of glossed over this earlier, is, you know, right at the center of this two by two was this uh, infinite loop of change. You know, I said earlier, I mean, this is, I mean, we all know this, right? We're all experiencing just, I mean, this year in 2020, more than ever, we're like, okay, yeah, wow, yeah, change comes at you and it comes at you fast. You know, we have wrestled with this for a while. You know, there's always been this gap that's been growing between the speed by which technology changes, which is arguably exponentially, like Moore's Law, and the rate by which organizations change and people change, which, you know, is not exponentially, right? You know, uh, change is hard. Um, and so, the, you know, I mean, the, the, the big management challenge we're all struggling with is how do you balance these two? And the truth is, there's really only two things you can do. You can be very deliberate about which changes you embrace because you can't embrace them all. There's just too many. Uh, so you have to be really strategic about which ones are most relevant to your business, your customers. And then, well, you can't change at the rate of technology. You can change faster than your competitors. And this is this whole idea of becoming a more agile organization. You know, you don't have to outrun the bear. <laughs> you just have to outrun, you know, like the person next to you. Uh, leave them to the bear. And so this is one of the most important missions of marketing operations and technology leadership is designing the marketing operations infrastructure and organization for change. 
There was a survey uh, a couple years ago, I, I loved it, it was actually by an IT uh, group, that they asked what the average duration was for a technical initiative between a business request to deployment. Um, right? You ask for something, how long does it take before uh, you know, IT gets it to you? Um, and a third, more than a third, said, okay, well, it's more than a year or even more than two years. You know, and this probably doesn't come as a surprise to you because, right, I mean, this is, we've had decades of, yeah, this was just how technology change happened. You know, put in the request, it takes a really long time to implement. Um, but we kind of have come to this realization more and more that, right, like in today's world, like when COVID hit and businesses were having to like adapt to COVID, it, it, it was just not an option to say like, yeah, well, we'll figure out how we get to that next year. Uh, it's like, no, you actually need to change now or, you know, we're, we're just out of business. Um, I particularly love the 3% who uh, said uh, they don't know. I, I somehow picture this person <laughs> in an organization who's like, um, yeah, I made that request uh, for the change to the website. Uh, oh man, that was years ago. And then I retired, you know, I now spend time with my grandchildren. I wonder if they'll ever get to that someday. Um, right? We, we, we can't operate in that mode in today's world. We need the ability to change much faster. And so with marketing operations leadership, you really want to start looking at ways that you can enable that sort of rapid change. And it's using things like this framework from Gartner for uh, pace layering to not treating all the technology in your marketing stack the same way, you know, but being able to distinguish between like foundational systems of record that shouldn't change very frequently, while at the same time being able to have a set of technology where you actually embrace these, you know, rapid pilot projects as systems of innovation. And I promised I'd show you at least one more of a stacky uh, slide. Uh, this was one that Microsoft uh, sent in a couple years ago. And one of the reasons I loved it, well, a bunch of reasons. Uh, one was because, yeah, they mapped this to the customer journey as an infinite loop. But the other is the three shades of blue here are actually mapped to that Gartner pace layering model. You know, systems of record, systems of differentiation, systems of innovation. Uh -huh. In the interest of time, I won't dig into this deeply right now, but yeah, you can get this whole slide deck and definitely <laughs> recommend, uh, I'll leave this as an exercise to the listener. So part of this design for change is embracing the use of open platforms. I mean, in marketing, like years ago, we used to be in this debate between sweet versus best of breed. You know, do I get everything from one vendor? Do I assemble everything from, you know, the best ones in each category? Uh, and this was kind of a really painful choice because the truth is you really wanted both. <laughs> um, and the good news is this is where the industry seems to be headed. You know, moving from sweet versus best of breed to increasingly looking at this as platform ecosystems, having these foundational systems, you know, like Adobe, like Salesforce, like Oracle, like, you know, HubSpot, all right, I'll get a plug for HubSpot in here too, and then being able to extend capabilities around that. Because, you know, when people look at my crazy MarTech map and they say, oh, you know, marketing really needs to consolidate its technology, the truth is it actually is consolidating. Is It's not really clear from the MarTech landscape, but it, when you dig into the data, it's actually a long tail. You know, out of all those 8,000 companies, there's, there's, there's a relatively small number that are major primary platforms. Then you start getting down into a few hundred category leaders, and then you increasingly get into this realm of thousands of specialist apps and components in the long tail. And where things get really, really interesting is as those major platforms at the head open up and make it easier for the specialist apps to plug in, you're able to give customers the best of both worlds. It is sweet and best of breed. Um, you know, when we think about things integrating, I just want to say, I mean, there is a lot of opportunity for integrations to get better between these tools, right? It's not just about uh, data, which we can think of as like the nouns, you know, oh yeah, we want to sync up the data between these systems. It's about how we integrate the workflow across tools, which is the verbs. It's how we embed some of the UI across these tools so that we're speaking the same language across these tools. And it's also how we put good governance in place around these ecosystems so that customers know when they're selecting apps within a particular platform ecosystem that it's going to be compliant, that it's going to work well, that it's um, a, a responsible citizen. And the last thing about change is 
really embracing this concept of agile marketing. Again, this really isn't about technology. This is about a management approach. Uh, my book, Hacking Marketing, was really all about how we adopt management ideas from the software world to marketing because, yeah, marketing is in many ways, has many of the same dynamics, uh, you know, as uh, software development these days. Um, how do we leverage this? You know, and this is growing. Uh, the folks at uh, Agile Sherpa who track this, uh, you know, I've seen about a third of the companies they interview year over year uh, using Agile methodologies. Um, and Agile isn't just like, you know, like a, a fun word to say. It really does come down to very specific practices. You can have flexibility in which practices you embrace and how you, you know, adapt them to your business, you know, but it's not just saying work faster. <laughs> it's about actually structuring the way work gets done, you know, to enable iteration and adaptation. And maybe, I guess I'll leave you with this, right? I mean, for all the technologies and architecture choices and management methodologies, at the end of the day, being really good at change it boils down to embracing an open mindset. We have to be willing to change. So uh, I hope, uh, I, I know I've hit you with a lot at the end of a uh, long day uh, before uh, what hopefully will be a really great weekend for you. Um, but I do hope, uh, yeah, some aspect of this framework uh, you will find helpful uh, as you continue to take advantage of what I really do believe is the golden age of marketing at this point. There's, it's, it's really an incredible time to be a marketer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Scott. That was a fantastic presentation. I must say this. Amazing. Gold mine of information, I must add. And we're getting so many questions. Uh, we have time for a few. I'll start with, then Sonakshi has some of them. Um, if you can hear me, Scott, the first question is, uh, it's from Anim Animesh. Uh, he's asking, in terms of industries, which are the biggest users of marketing technology? Have you done any research on that? Yeah, I haven't done a lot of primary research myself, but uh, I've, I've seen data from others. And as you might expect, the initial successes here, like the people who have really been early adopters in marketing technology and leveraged it the most, are companies that were sort of technology oriented to begin with. So certainly like software companies, you know, are generally very strong users. Um, also in the consumer side, the rise of these direct to consumer brands, that when you think about it, I mean, they're technology companies more than anything. I mean, they're basically a technology and a brand uh, and, and they've gotten really good at it. Uh, so one of the things I often recommend to people is to look at some of the leading software companies and look at some of the leading uh, D2C brands uh, to see some of the tactics and tools uh, they're leveraging in MarTech. Right. So now you want to go next? So your audio is muted. We actually do have another question. It's from Apurva Durga. He says, first thing, hi, Scott. Great framework. Thank you for sharing it. Do you think some of the organizational factors, for example, organization culture, and perhaps some other parameters determine what can be centralized and what really should be decentralized? Yeah, it's a great question. And the truth is the, the barriers to decentralization are not technical. At this point, there is an incredible amount of technology out there that can empower the edge of the organization. Um, the barriers are almost entirely cultural and managerial, uh, that we are just used to thinking of organizations as these very hierarchical centralized structures, uh, you know, and because again, that, that, that's fine. That's, that's, that's where we came from. That was a certain era. Uh, but I think if there's one, one of the benefits, if I can say the word benefit in this context of the COVID crisis has been, we realized the ability to leverage distributed and decentralized teams can actually be really, really helpful in today's environment. So I'm hoping that, that that will stir a lot of people thinking about, okay, maybe we should consider how we can empower uh, the organization a little bit more decentrally. Right. Um, yes, yes, please, please go on. In terms of industries, what are the biggest users of marketing technology? Have you done any research on that? I, I asked that just before uh, 
this i i just asked this i'm question, sorry actually. i'm sorry i have the wrong so question. so i i i have a question there's a viewer from dubai uh, who has asked a very specific question is we noticed that the number of countries represented on your landscape going up what do you attribute that to is it cultural difference or emergence of uh, new talent across the world yeah it's it's a great question and i i should disclaim one of the reasons the number of technologies keep going up on my landscape is because new companies are being created but it also keeps going up because frankly we keep discovering more um you know being based in the us particularly the way a lot of search engines work where they tend to you know highly localize search results it's actually been pretty hard for me to discover all the different technologies in different countries around the world uh and so i'm always very grateful when other people in these countries in these regions reach out to me and they're like oh my goodness scott you missed all these companies here let me share with you all these you know companies are doing this so i i i i think it is a lot larger as to why those companies exist that's a really interesting question and i think the 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 it's it's a mix of a couple things one is certainly from a demand side i mean marketing technology gets so tied into the way we actually engage with our customers and there are so many things about how we engage with customers that are specific to our industry they're specific to regions there are cultural differences that i do think there's very legitimate reasons to have specialist applications in different countries mm. i think the other reason why it happens is because you know as we said earlier it's just there's no barriers to software entry so what happened is you know an entrepreneur in a particular country saw that there was a need it wasn't being served by one of the global martech companies well so they build a product and they they won customers and their customers love them you know and they're growing and it's great you know i mean so will will they succeed on a more broader global scale that's when you get into the whole consolidation battle of some of them will i mean this is one of the things you see now a lot is some of these you know companies that start in a you know region other than silicon valley we're now starting to see a lot of examples of those companies end up taking over and they become the winner on a global market so uh I I am very uh, bullish uh, on entrepreneurial uh, martech uh, from different regions around the world. What is it um so we have one more question is from Animesh Mishra. He is asking in India almost 90% of the companies co collecting data do not have martech application or DMP or CDP implemented in their system. it's uh, it will take time for them to realize the adverse impact how can things be uh, fast forwarded for all businesses to realize it's an imperative to adopt technologies yeah um i mean this is a challenge right we know the technology changes much faster than uh, organizations do um i think there's at the end of the day what motivates businesses is survival in competition and i think again this is one of the things coming out of this covid crisis where i think a lot of companies who felt they did not need to worry that much about how good their digital game was are realizing oh my goodness actually if i end up in a situation where the only way i can do business with my customers is digitally wow we really need to do this well and particularly if they've got a competitor you know in their market who is better at it than they are yeah. I find that tends to be a, <laughs> as strong of a motivation as anything to uh you know make the investment and learn how to do this. Right. Um I have a quick question is uh, what what do you think will be the long term impact of covid on marketing tech um, marketing tech you know what would be you know what would stay in it what would change in it. Yeah it's um You know the the that famous quote about you know making predictions uh, is hard especially about the future um I think the biggest change I expect is I don't believe technology is going to consolidate down to a few products I think we are now in a world where every company more or less is going to become a software company to some degree and any company that writes its own software to do some special part of its business or some special part of how it engages with customers you know that software is going to be written in the cloud it's going to have apis you're going to have all these services to make it easier to interconnect these things 
Um, at some point, I think the MarTech landscape goes away because at some point it's, it's, it's almost like it becomes futile. It's like, okay, well, I mean, if you really, yes, there's the major companies, the, the Adobe's, the Salesforce's, the HubSpot's, the whoever, you know, but there's literally going to be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these highly specialized marketing apps. Um, and exactly how quickly that happens and, and you know, uh, what are the emerging technologies that accelerate it? Um, you know, that's where it gets harder to see exactly what will happen in a given year. But I think 10 years from now, we'll look at a world where, yeah, just, you know, there's millions of software apps everywhere. Uh, and we think a bit as naturally as we do electricity. So we have a question from Kashyap Kampela. Uh, it's quite nice presentation. How do you see the impact of COVID on the MarTech landscape? Uh, do you see a reduction on the number of vendors? Do you see any new categories emerging? Yes, it's a really fascinating question because there are basically things about COVID that are going to harm the MarTech landscape, right? I mean, business uncertainty, uh, you know, translates to for companies that are VC backed, uh, funding uncertainty. Um, you know, MarTech companies are not immune from the, the headwinds uh, of the COVID crisis. On the other hand, you know, one of the, I mean, if you look at the global stock markets for SaaS companies, uh, they've actually been doing great, uh, you know, throughout this crisis. And I think one of the reasons why is people, is, is that we were talking about earlier, right? It's almost like this COVID crisis has become a catalyst that makes us realize how important it is to start to get really serious about implementing digital business. Um, and in that way, I think actually, yeah, it's, it's a great time for a lot of marketing technologies to step up and to be able to say, we can help. We can get you to be a much better digital organization than you were before. So what the balance is between the negative and the positive, I don't know, but if I was a betting man, I think actually over the next two years, I think we'll see more growth in the MarTech industry, not less. Uh, I have a question from Munawar Hussain. Uh, he's asking, how do you think uh, we have, um, do you think, sorry, do you think we have to merge uh, in marketing new technology and remove old technology and make it convenient to have perfect tools? So I'm not entirely sure I understood the question. Is it like merging? Um, um, yes, merging new technology, removing old technology and Ma and making it more convenient you know, for the end users. Yes, yes. Oh, so <laughs> definitely. So I'll start with that last one. Absolutely. You know, marketing technology suffers from the same problem that a lot of technology does, which is it actually kind of sucks to use. I mean, the software industry is getting better about user experience, uh, you know, and certainly we have a few companies, you know, like... Um, you know, like the Apple iPhone was always held out as like, oh, what a great user experience. Um, we got a long ways to go as an industry to, I think, make software easier for people to use, more intuitive, especially in that mode of where you're talking about decentralization and you're really wanting to empower people who are not technical to be able to get the most value out of this. Uh, as far as things merging together between old and new technologies, um, you know, we, we mentioned very briefly in the presentation this integration platform as a service category. Um, that is actually a very rich category. I mean, there are easily 100 companies in that space. Um, and while some of them are focused on how do you connect different cloud applications together, there's actually quite a bit of that technology that's focused on how do you interface to legacy systems. Because we've got a lot of legacy systems out there. It's going to take a long time before they get replatformed in the cloud. Uh, and, you, you know, if you're a business of any scale with any real history, yes, you need to have a strategy about how you integrate those legacy systems into your more modern, uh, you know, cloud, cloud digital marketing as well. Um, we have one last question for the day. Just a second. Mr. Dhansinkar R. You mentioned influencer marketing. Is there an uptick for employees to be the brand advocates in a decentralized way rather than making advertise rather than marketing driving the brand messages? I'll repeat that. You mentioned influencer marketing. Is there an uptick for employees to be the brand advocate in a decentralized way rather than marketing driving the brand messages? 
Yes. I think this is one of the cases where you want the balance between centralization and decentralization, right? You want marketing to provide some sort of framework, uh, this enlightened governance of, okay, let's make sure we understand together what the brand messages are and make sure that we're aligned and that, you know, what we're sharing, you know, uh, uh, is consistent, you know, so that when different, you know, people connect with, uh, you know, different employees in the company, you know, they, they, they don't feel like they're dealing with like 20 different companies. They feel like, oh yeah, this is all the same company. I think with that framework in place, then you're absolutely right. You then want to empower those individuals on the edge of the organization to apply that framework uh, to engage in personal and direct ways. Um, I mean, this is, you know, so, social media, uh, you know, it's, it is a very human channel. Uh, and there's, I mean, you can buy all sorts of advertising from a centralization, centralized marketing program, uh, but that no way ever comes close to the sort of one-to-one personal connections you get when you have a real brand advocate, you know, talking, you know, from the heart because this is the work they do. It's not because they were hired by marketing to do this. It's because this is what they do and they love it and they know a lot about it and they enjoy uh, engaging with customers around it. Um, yeah, you, you, you can't buy that. That's amazing. Okay. So before we conclude, just one last question. Uh, what is your guess for 2021's landscape or like 10,000 or 12,000 or like, is it even higher? Do you think like people are going to be betting on it by the end of the day? <laughs> yeah. Is there a prediction market somewhere? Um, so I don't know. You know, part of the challenge is um, like, if you'd asked me last year, I would have predicted that the landscape would have shrunk. Yeah. I, I thought 7,000 was a lot. I thought it was probably going to contract a bit. The fact that it went up to 8,000 caught me completely by surprise. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that makes it challenging is, well, two reasons. One is you have to decide what qualifies as a marketing technology. And the truth is, I mean, there's a whole bunch of marketing technology tools that I, I didn't consider qualified, but you, you could make the argument that they should be. So, for instance, like, let's just take WordPress, the most popular content management system on the platform. WordPress has an ecosystem of nearly 60,000 plugins. Now, again, most of those plugins suck. Most, a uh, bunch of those plugins are dead, right? So they're not all active. But still, when you think about it, there's probably easily now several thousand plugins for WordPress that are active and being used in some way in marketing experiences. So the question becomes, do those thousands of plugins, do they count? Should they be on the MarTech landscape? Now, for the most part, I, I said no, unless if they were like really super popular, you know, like Yoast or something like that. Um, but I think it's one of the reasons why it becomes hard to like peg a number is because the truth is the boundaries on what we consider to be marketing technology are pretty fluid. How, how's that for dodging the question? <laughs> Very nice. Very nicely done, I must say that. But I think on that note, we're going to end today, uh, session, your session with Scott. Thank, Thank you, so Scott, much for this wonderful session. Fantastic presentation. Thank you so much for Thank having me. Have a great time. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to the next session for the day. It's a very special session. It's actually a leaders panel. We have with us three fantastic speakers, Paran, Paran Thingu Thiru Bengadam, CTO MedLife. Yash Dayal, CTO Zivame, and Sandeep Komaraveli, Director of International Growth, Shopify. So I welcome all of you. Uh, please, reveal. we can start with the session. Yes. Uh, welcome. I'm your co-moderator, uh, Sonakshi, and me will be uh, asking questions. Uh, before we begin, I just want to announce that we are live on uh, social platforms as well as you can post your questions on Zoom. Uh, we will be glad to be asking our esteemed speakers. Uh, without uh, further delay, I want to straight away go to my uh, very first question. Uh, I will start with you, uh, Mr. Sandeep. If you're there, uh, yes, you can hear me, yes. Hello, yes. Yes. Uh, tell me, uh, we're talking about uh, e-commerce and the road ahead. First, tell me, uh, how has e-commerce uh, journey been in the, uh, it becomes a very must-ask question in the last 90 days, if I may say. Yeah, I think like most of the things that we know have changed for good. And some, I don't know if they're going to go back to normal, given what we are seeing, but 
uh, specific to e-commerce, I think there are two large trends that we've observed at Shopify. Uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, and maybe I can briefly touch upon uh, both of them. The first one, I think, is uh, something that, that you would expect. There is a lot of surge in, in demand for retailers and businesses wanting to go online. And, and that is expected because obviously all the businesses who've considered online as a nice to have channel now no longer look at it as a nice to have because of like the constraints uh, that we are living currently under. What has been interesting is also like the type of retailers who are going online. So we see a lot of interest from brick and mortar uh, uh, retailers and also those who are in the essential goods category. Uh, there's been a lot of demand and, and surge in uh, you know, those businesses wanting to go online. That's, I think, the first trend. Uh, the second one, I think, is uh, just businesses and retailers realizing the importance of uh, not only selling locally, but also being able to deliver locally. As you're aware, like, you know, because of all the constraints, it has become very important to have uh, these tools and these platforms which can help you not only market yourself uh, effectively within your neighborhood, within the locality, but also being able to deliver that. Uh, and I think that has also changed the way businesses uh, think of online as a channel uh, traditionally. So those are the two uh, big trends amongst a lot of the other smaller ones that we've observed in Shopify. Varant, uh, the same question to you. What are your observations of the last 90 days and the impact it has on e-commerce? See, there is a big shift in the landscape when I say April, March, April to now. See, if you look at March and April timeframe, we had a lot of problems from the healthcare because Medlife is an e-health platform. We had fundamental issues of supply chain completely broken. We couldn't get people to our warehouse. We couldn't find people to deliver medicines, even though the demand is very high. The demand was actually high even starting, but we had all these challenges because of which we couldn't do. But after like May onwards, the supply chain, interstate supply chain was fine. We could be able to get people both from our warehouse perspective as well as from our last mile perspective. But some of the challenges we see is, so each of these ones, there is a SOP now published by the government to maintain it of, for example, how to run a warehouse, how to maintain a last mile system, last mile agents. These things are putting in an additional constraint which are needed necessarily. Those are some of the things which is happening here. But the good part about the whole spectrum is, for example, if you see a consumer behavior, our e-consultation before was actually very less. Pre predominantly people used to come to us for buying medicines in online. But now because the going to a hospital is a bigger problem for them, our consultation, e-consultation demand has improved drastically. The same is the case with e-pharmacy because people are scared to actually go to an offline pharmacy to meet in. So that's why the demand is very good for us in both these things. But there are some constraints by which we have to operate, which is taking a toll on it. That's pretty much. Yes, if you take the real mirror view, how do you see this uh, last three months? Sorry, your audio is muted. Sorry. Uh, hey, first of all, uh, guys, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Yash. Uh, I work for Zivame. Uh, I think most of you guys know uh, Zivame is uh, India's leading destination uh, for women's intimate wear in India. Uh, and uh, my role in Zivame is uh, uh, leading the world technology vision of the company. Uh, I think I would agree uh, with uh, what Prashant and uh, Sandeep have said, right? Uh, sorry, what Parant and uh, Sandeep have said. It's been a, a roller coaster ride, uh, would be like almost like an understatement. Uh, I think in Zivame, we've gone through uh, stages uh, where we had a complete store shut down, we were not getting uh, orders in. Uh, Again, lots of challenges on the supply chain side. Uh, so, uh, and uh, and I think what is uh, <clears throat> what was very uh, in interesting and uh, scary at the same time was that you you didn't so until now there was still a little bit of predictability. So even though we say e-commerce is very fast, changing rapidly, uh, but the amount of unpredictability during these times was just uh, enormous, right? So you would not know tomorrow whether your warehouse is working or whether there'll be a, a containment in the warehouse. Uh, uh, whether uh, uh, whether your your office can continue. Of course, a lot of us, uh, everyone started working from home, so that brought its own set of uh, interesting uh, challenges. Uh, so uh, overall, uh, I would say a, a whirlwind and roller coaster thing. Uh, but uh, but on the positive side, right? If you look at everything, uh, where for any constraint, what are the opportunities? I think it gave us 
a, a very nice opportunity where uh, <clears throat> uh, we were so typically companies uh, e-commerce companies especially are always rushing to uh, uh, to manage the scale and there's a lot of uh, chaos to, to to support the business uh, so the opportunity here was that it took we could all take a little bit of we got a little bit of elbow room to go out and clean the shop and clean the house a little bit and clean the tech so right um uh, parant i want to come to you with this question yours is a different category uh, there is a surge in demand right there is uh, uh despite what the market sentiment is i mean there's a certain kind of uh, you know traffic that's coming your way uh from the tech perspective if i had to ask you from the marketing technology perspective have you uh, what are the different changes or different adaptations or different uh, readjustments that you have made to suit the timing the, the way customers tend to engage with e-commerce platforms in this uh, in this kind of a pandemic time See, overall, in the case of tech, if you see, there are a lot of things we have changed. If you look at our business, early February, I would say majority of our customers pay by COD, cash on delivery. But now there is a need for a contactless delivery to come in, and there is a need for us to get a prepayment share increased drastically. So that is the first point from the customer perspective to see. This is one of the biggest change we have done, and pretty much in every flow. we want to adopt a prepaid for that so now customers are not used to it because they are historically used to paying by cash so when we come to the door step we enable them hey i'll push you an sms you can directly pay it right at the door point or i'll give you a qr code right at the door point you can pay it so that is one step of the journey the yeah. other one if you look at it for example our diagnostics business wherein we come to home pick up our blood sample this is very scary right why will anybody come to you because at this point in time but there are a lot of chronic patients if you are a diabetic patient you are expected to do a sample test a quarter once so normally when a diagnostics person when a phlebotomist goes to our house he will have everything he'll have a gloves all the new kits but now he'll have a pp kit and we'll actually give him a lot more safety precautions so that the customer is a lot more comfortable if i shift this from a customer to our warehouse side originally when our warehouse agents comes into a warehouse they have a biometric one which will do the fingerprinting and they enter now because of the covid time we cannot allow him to do that so then there is a face recognition one based on this we have and put as attendance so the attendance right from the attendance registering rostering doing it bookmarking is timing everything has changed from the warehouse side as well as from the end customer multiple things these are the things we have changed Sandeep, how has it been for you from the tech marketing tech side? Uh, did you get enough time to kind of uh, change, adapt to new technology? <clears throat> Because initially, I think there was a dip in sentiment of purchase sentiment. How did you utilize that time, and did you add any new features from the tech side of it? Could you take us through that? Yeah, for sure. And and for us, I think it's a lot more to do with how we are able to uh, work and enable our merchants. because shopify as you may be aware is a platform that is helping merchants to go online right and it is a platform that can help you just not only set up quickly but also grow and manage your retail business irrespective of how small or how big you are right so our view to all of this is basically enabling and supporting merchants who are either going online for the first time or those who want to uh, those who are completely reliant only on online channel for their sales and there were two three things that we had done on that side of uh, uh, on on both of these which is for new businesses or new entrepreneurs who are coming and setting up an online store how do we enable them to actually do that in a very short window is what we've been focused on and as i mentioned earlier is there a way in which we can build out teams so we have like these teams which are uh, helpful for uh, for for these new merchants to immediately go online within a couple of hours there are also tools that we have provided to merchants so that they can easily communicate with their customers uh, through social channels through email through all of these tools uh, and, and for those who are already online and are like you know growing their business uh, we've started working uh, we started providing tools and integrations with all the local payment methods paran spoke about contact contactless delivery uh, also uh, how do you how do you transform all the demand that has been there uh, from uh, from your uh, physical uh, stores how do you basically uh convert that into online demand and and what is the easiest way to do that i think those are some of the areas where we've been focused on 
and, and that has been really helpful. Uh, I think the other other aspect of it has also been around just communication and increasing awareness on what are the best ways that you can uh, that you can use all of the tools available. Right, uh, a lot of the tools are already available. I think if there's one thing that has happened in the last few years, it's just like the barrier for using some of these technology tools has gone down so much, both from a cost perspective and even from a uh, usage perspective. So I think a lot of focus was also on just educating all of these uh, retailers and, and merchants and brands on uh, how do you make use of all of these to effectively just keep your business running and growing. Okay. Uh, yes, your, your category has a bit of vanity in it. You know, people are very specific, very particular about uh, buying intimate wear and uh, how do you enable an online experience that matches the offline part of it? I mean, the use of tech here is become very critical in your category, especially, you know. Uh, tell me, I mean, you said you get a, got a lot of time to do away with some tech parts and introduce new ones. What were the new features added and how did you utilize this time to build a very effective marketing tech site? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, so there were basically uh, two things that we that we started working on. Uh, so again, let me rephrase that we, we didn't get a lot of time, but I think relatively we got a little bit more time. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, I think one of the ones was that uh, as uh, I think one of the core things we did is we took a look at what are uh, what are core uh, uh, what are core uh, improvements and optimizations we could do on this on the on our servers. Uh, and uh, and actually that also helped in reducing some of our uh, server costs uh, mm -hmm. and that is uh, overall added to more uh, to it adds to the business health uh, in fact uh, i was speaking to some of my friends at aws and they said that this is something which they're seeing across the industry like most companies uh, have actually uh, gone in and uh, uh, dub double down on figuring out how to how to optimize their infrastructure uh, and uh, they they're actually seeing aws bills go down for most of the startups uh, and uh, the other thing is, I think it's something which uh, will also happen naturally is uh, I think as, uh, as people were talking about contactless experience, right? So uh, the moment you go into a store, that's a very it kind of becomes like a contact heavy experience. Uh, so uh, I'm, so I think one of the things we are, uh, we are looking to understand is whether they happen, whether there is a shift which happens from people uh, who were traditionally going to retail stores whether they actually start shifting towards the digital uh, towards the digital format. Um, having said that, uh, I think uh, at least on a retail store, we've ensured that all the safety and hygiene is there. So if a customer really wants to go into a retail store, um, uh, they should they should feel like completely comfortable going there. Apparent, tell me, uh, there's another factor which is that uh, a seamless experience. You know, customer is. Uh, buying online, but that they expect a certain kind of experience. And how are you using tech to enable you know, that seamless transition, a quick solution? And also, uh, how, what have been the key learnings from this phase, particularly what will st that will stay with you as part of your strategy, especially the marketing uh, tech side of it? See, if you look at a seamless experience, there are multiple things we have done actually during the COVID time. So for example, you take a prescription and you go to a medical shop and let's say a particular composition is not there. You know what the pharmacist will say, Hey, I don't have this combination, but I have this composition here. The molecular comp composition is same. Do you want to get it? So most of the time you go with the person and get it. But mostly in online, when we originally used to come, we never used to give the seamless experience. So we say, Hey, whatever you're searching is not there. It's not there. Then we realized later, because our supply is blocked in, there are a lot of the substitutes that we used to have in, which we never exposed to the end user. So now if you come in, exactly how you shop in, in an offline, you will get the same experience if you come to in life. You'll see, you'll search for a medicine and it'll say, hey, this is the medicine which is there. This is maybe a generic one, or it is a patented one, which is costly. These are the substitutes, same molecular composition. It is generic and it is available in inventory. It is at a cheaper discount. So the experience of what does customers are needing is exactly what do they expect from an offline pharmacy thing? The same experience they prefer to get it from the store, this one. And the next one, see, sometimes when you go to a hospital, right, you finish a doctor and you go to a pharmacist, 
sometimes the doctor says hey you have these medications to buy and these are the pathology test or the blood test that you need to do mm-hmm. so you need a single place where you are able to do both in the same one and you come back right similarly the one when you come to a chronic patient you are a diabetic and you are going and buying these ones immediately we'll show you hey you are a diabetic patient these are the packages that we have for your blood test to finish in and this is what you can get through it so exactly what you walk into a hospital the same experience or if you go to a pharmacy to buy the similar experience you will see in the ecom space that's one of the similar experience we will now do so i will be asking questions to sandeep and yash and then sonakshi we're getting a lot of questions he'll come with some more audience questions also flowing so we don't want to miss on them so sandeep i want to come to you that you have the vendor side and you have the customer side Right. Where did you innovate the most? Where was the need to innovate the most as far as the tech part is concerned? You know, and uh, what were those innovations? If you can tell us, you know, specifically. Yeah, I mean, our our platform is essentially for merchants. So whatever we do is largely for the merchants. And for us, most of the things that we do is feedback that we receive from the merchant saying, "Hey, I have this for our for for my customer. So can you enable that?" i think a couple of things in specific to like what happened in the last 90 days is basically one to do with communication so are there ways in which we can help these merchants communicate better with their customers so integration integration with social platforms live updates is there a way in which we can keep constant communication going i think it's just a matter of setting the right expectation it's not like you want you want the delivery to happen in 2 hours or one day it's about like just keeping the customers informed so what is the best way to keep in touch with the customers second i think is more to do with how do you enable that all the all the things that you're doing as a business be it from like you know uh, your stock outs or inventory or pricing changes all of those you are able to you are able to manage it efficiently i think those are the those are the areas where uh, at least shopify has had like a lot of uh, uh, tools and and features because i think it becomes most important to set the right expectation in times like these when you have a lot of uh, you know a lot of fluctuations not just in like you know the constraints in running your own business but even externally as well the other other important uh, um, uh, I, i don't think it's an innovation but a change that we have seen at least of brands who've done better is like using the social channels not just as channels to communicate promotions or way to acquire customers but also using them as channels to collect feedback and interact uh that has not been like a uh, you know that, that that has not been one of the ways uh in in which social channel could traditionally use but it's been encouraging to see how that has been helpful so tools of like how do you have a unified inbox to communicate to to manage all the messages that you're getting from customers across all social platforms or integration with uh, platforms which can push out live updates on various packages through whatsapp so things like those which have which, which are largely in the communication uh, domain is where uh, uh is we've seen feedback from merchants that they have been very helpful right yes sure. uh, my question to you is that uh, customer engagement in this period becomes very critical part of it and i think tech is the only way of course to stay connected are you also as part of your marketing uh, policy and strategy waiting for the offline to open or are you completely adjusting to an online in a way uh, that customers stay engaged and how are you planning to keep them engaged using tech okay uh <clears throat> so i think uh, thankfully uh, uh i think we have all all types of zivami customers uh and uh, i hope that uh, that a majority of them uh, are actually uh, do both offline as well as online um i think uh, a lot of ch- uh, a lot of changes in how the communication is happening uh, i think during covid times there was a lot of communication about how our customers can uh, so we understood that that time it was uh, paramount Uh, for customers to feel comfortable about safety and hygiene uh, so a lot of uh, help on how they can manage themselves during covid times uh, a lot of communication on those things uh, and another thing which uh, i think across the industry people are seeing is for example if you look at uh, if you consider the maslow's pyramid uh, i think customers have actually dropped down uh, several levels so i think suddenly uh, uh, safety hygiene is becoming paramount and also with all the economic changes i think there's a lot more focus uh, on on getting value and focus on value uh, so i think those are some of the innovations which we are trying to do uh, for instance uh, zivame has started selling uh, covid uh, to uh, covid masks uh, so <clears throat> so that's an essential item that you can start buying uh, and overall i think there were a lot of uh, quick 
quick innovations which we had to do. For example, uh, uh, a large portion of our catalog is not essentials. Uh, so we had places where, uh, where, where deliveries could happen uh, today, but not happen tomorrow. Uh, if an order is coming from a red zone, how do we manage those? So a lot of uh, innovation went in all around towards the front end, uh, towards front, the customer facing side, as well as on the back end warehouse side to manage all of these things. Sunakshi, my colleague has some questions for me. Yes, I have received a few audience questions. The first one is by Vikram Kumar. Parant, this is for you. Did you see significant change in behavior of patients being open to shift prescriptions from what their doctor wrote? Or do they still insist on sticking to what doctors write? See, it is, there is a big shift. And it is not just because of COVID also, but COVID time, it has improved drastically. I'll tell you, that is why I was telling you on the substitution one. So originally, if you see when a patient, when they upload a prescription, exactly what the medicine is there is what they prefer. Otherwise, they'll mostly say no. Now, patients understand because there is a lot of engagement we have done. Our customer care agents have called them before to do a substitute. And that we have been doing for months. Then as part of COVID, what we did is as a tech facility in the app itself, you can do. So customers have changed a lot now. And they are okay to do a substitute, provided you give them the enough information, what's a composition which is matching both. So there is a big landscape shift on the substitution model. So one is for Sandeep. Do countries behave differently when it comes to e-commerce otherwise? Uh, I think it, um, the, the larger trends have remained the same. So like most of the retailers wanting to go online, I think those are the trends that have remained the same. The differences that we have seen is primarily in terms of uh, the regulatory landscape. Like, for example, in India, the non-essential ban on e-commerce was there. So all the sh all the demand and everything that we've seen is largely for those retailers who are in the essential goods category. But outside of that, I think, you know, uh, the, the, the trend has been similar that, you know, uh, the, there's an increase in demand for like shifting your business to online. There's an, the, the, uh, most of the retailers are now looking at how do you efficiently grow that channel and not look at it as a as a supplement, but almost like you know one of the important channels along with your uh, physical stores or physical business. So uh, I'd say like the larger trends are similar. Of course, the local nuances are always there, but uh, the larger trends are, are are similar right across countries. All right. So I have another question, which is for uh, Parant as well as for Yash. Do you develop a lot of technology frameworks in-house or do you acquire them off the shelf? So, uh, Parant, maybe you can start first. Okay, so majority of them, we take it from open source. Actually, we don't develop. In fact, pretty much the entire stack, I would say, is actually picked it up from the open source ones. And our deployment 100% is out of AWS. But there are some things which are, we don't go and buy products. For example, if we build a data platform, it's not like the off the shelf data platform we pick it up. We take Apache uh, Spark as an engine for us and then we build our data platform because there are a lot of stitching that you have to do it. So we don't buy off the shelf products, but we don't go for licensed tech stacks. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, similar to what Parant mentioned, uh, I think we try to build uh, as much as we can in house. Again, uh, we're also based on uh, OpenStack. Uh, so uh, try to uh, uh, try to leverage those, uh, but try to build as much as we can in-house. Uh, okay, so last question for all three of you. What do you think are the future uh, future trends considering all three of you from di completely different e-commerce portals? So the, the trends are completely different. In your so, respective, yes. Yeah, so irrespective. So what do you think is the next one? Um, Sandeep? Okay, yeah, I mean, the uh, I think the the most important one that I feel is that, uh, you know, some of the consumer behavior that has changed or that has been forced because of COVID, I think that will continue, which is good news for a lot of the merchants who are looking at online business. Uh, so that trend, I think, is going to continue. Uh, the second one, I think, is like all the, uh, you know, uh, the, the technology tools that are available today, that I think they will be uh, like a sea change or improvement and all of them will evolve over a period of time because you know with changing times and like changing demands and requirements we they also need to evolve so i think both of them are, are like uh, things that at least uh, in my view are going to continue even after even after uh, the normalcy returns i don't know wherever that is but yeah 
after after the after the current set of uh, constraints go away okay paran in the e health space there is actually a big shift in the consumer behavior and we think this is going to stay on for a long time i'll give you two examples if you look at pre covid time we still used to have e consultation which is that paid consultation you fix a doctor and you speak mm -hmm. but if you see for what all disease types they come there it's pretty much one or two like 90% i would say is mental health issue or sexology issue these are the only reasons for which they come to e consultation rest all of the time they comfortable going and meeting a doctor face to face yeah during the covid time what happened a big shift is they understand the risk of going and meeting a doctor in the hospital or in the clinic so they actually tried out e consultation as part of this covid one and lot of them have become very comfortable and it's not just our platform if you look at all the e consultation platform in india startups everybody's traffic or the order count has gone multi x higher and now i think what will happen is let's say you live in bangalore and you have fever and you want to go meet a doctor and come back well, minimum i'll tell you 4 hours it'll take 3 to 4 hours by the time you drive go meet a doctor finish everything come back home easily you're done yeah. but here it's a 10 minutes call which you're done this luxury they actually opened up only because of covid necessity and we think this is going to stay on for a long time the other one is actually on the telemedicine side affordability and accessibility becomes an option before they didn't realize because sometimes they go to the next door buy a person but when you go to the next door shop and you buy you don't have enough data for example our tier one customers behave very differently if it is a patented drug i'll give you 10% discount but if it is a generic drug substitute in the same the discount range is very very high so these information they are never getting from the offline store Yeah. so once you expose all these things actually we are thinking in both these spaces it, the consumer behavior has changed drastically and it's going to remain there forever very nice report yash uh yeah i would echo with what uh, paran said uh i think unfortunately not such a big uh, spike as uh, what he was talking about in the in the e health sector uh, but overall i think uh, there there will be a trend of uh, people moving more towards online uh, so i think it's kind of like uh, what demonetization did right it kind of enforced digital payments on a lot of people so people were forced to use digital payments i think because of this lockdown and because of all the constraints which people have uh, i think uh, a lot of people who were not trying uh, online or who had some a little bit of hesitation a lot of them have actually uh, are trying online so i would see i would say there will be a trend towards moving into online space uh and just to support that right even if you look at the fashion industry uh if you look at some of the very traditional brick and mortar retailers like Z like zara and h&m all of them are actually setting up online shops so uh, it's it's a it's covid has changed the world for sure yeah. okay fantastic uh thank you so much dear panelists paran sandeep yash you guys have been great it has been a fantastic insightful session with this we actually end the martelic india bridge one series which is the first precursor to the main martech india event in uh, in september 2020 so i thank you once thank again you. everybody thank you, you everyone for joining us and we still i just want and to mention that we still have yes. a lot of questions unanswered but we will try to maybe yes we are little above thank time so but much. thank you thank so you much so we will definitely take it thank off you. thank, thank you. you thank you for the opportunity